first thing we're going to do tonight is we have a very special presentation of the Ralph Gould Award for Outstanding Citizenship. I'm going to go over to the podium and uh, deliver remarks from there. So uh, give me a second. So we in Cape Elizabeth are very fortunate to live in a community where so many people are invested in service to their friends and neighbors and commit their time, talents, and passions to making this town the special place that it is. And tonight, we're pleased to give special recognition to two of our fellow citizens, Nancy and Tim Thompson, by honoring them with the Ralph Gould Award for Outstanding Citizenship. I want to share with you just a few of the many reasons Nancy and Tim were chosen as this year's award winner. But first, for those that might not be aware, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Ralph Gould and this award that was established in 1986 and bears his name. Ralph Gould was the consummate community leader, a well-respected and successful businessman, the owner and operator of Gould Equipment Company. He was a supporter of the arts and music in the schools and community, and a longtime member of the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department, in fact, one of the leaders of the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department Band, which performed for many years at public functions, parades, and at, a popular, at popular variety shows that Ralph organized right where we're gathered here today, which was at one time the town's auditorium. I reached out to another distinguished Cape citizen and current president of the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society, Jim Rowe, for some thoughts about Ralph, and he shared this. He said every so often his name would pop up as a significant benefactor to or a driver of a project that never in an obnoxious or ostentatious way, though, always kind of quietly went unnoticed, unless, unless you were looking. That was his style. He was one of those individuals who, if you approached him with a well-defined and reasonable need, he had the means, but more importantly, the energy to help, but always quietly. It's that reflect, reflection from Jim that really resonates with me as I think about all of the incredible work that Nancy and Tim have done for the benefit of our, our community, so often without fanfare. Nancy and Tim are longtime Cape Elizabeth residents, volunteers, and business owners. In 2004, they tragically lost their middle child, Timmy, who had just graduated from Cape Elizabeth High School, to suicide. Since that time, and in his memory, they both have been passionate advocates speaking publicly about their loss in the hopes of saving lives. They urge those with emerging mental health issues to not take no for an answer and to push, for, push harder for services. They also encourage people to not be afraid to speak about their illness so they may be able to have others help them. And their efforts have helped in the passage of legislation that put in place today's training requirements to help educators and staff identify students at risk and know what steps to take to help to try to prevent suicide. Last year, through their Thompson Mental Health Initiative, in collaboration with the school department and the Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation and led by CEMS nurse Jill Young, they helped to launch a community-wide program focused on recognizing the importance of mental wellness and creating a foundation of advocacy, education, and awareness. The initiative, with the theme, You Will Be Found at CEMS, helped to empower students, staff, and parents to be proactive and confident in caring for themselves and others, provide tools and tips for improving mental health, introduce health resources in or near our school community, and decrease the stigma around mental health. Several of us on the council had the chance to participate in this initiative in different ways, including the community read-along of the book Finding Perfect. Their annual Thompson Award given through the CEF organization honors the faculty or staff member who reaches out to Cape Elizabeth students in lasting and meaningful ways and go above and beyond what is expected, providing students guidance and mentoring. And they have both served on numerous boards and with community service and philanthropic organizations through the years. To let you behind the curtain a little bit, the council actually discussed this award way back in the spring, but with the summer months and various different schedules and agendas to coordinate, it's not until now that we got it on this agenda tonight. In that light, though, I find it a bit ironic or maybe even a bit serendipitous that yesterday kicked off the annual National Suicide Prevention Week. I hope in some small measure we're doing our part to raise awareness here tonight. In addition, over the last two years, Tim generously served on the Comprehensive Plan Committee. Probably not realizing what he'd gotten himself into, Tim served as its chair and was a steady hand guiding a dedicated group of fellow citizens through an extremely rigorous and detailed process to accomplish the important work of updating the plan that serves as the foundation for much of the town's planning direction and ordinances. 
Councillor Penny Jordan, who served on the committee with him, noted how Tim was very good at ensuring everyone on the committee was heard, how he'd ask questions when it seemed they were at an impasse, drawing out comments to ensure that all perspectives were voiced and considered. As is his style, he made sure that it wasn't about the loudest voice, but about the collective voice of the team. And as town planner Maureen O'Meara described, Tim's strength is a genuine interest in where folks are coming from. He wants to hear from you and puts folks at ease who may start from a point of controversy, anxiousness, or hostility. He made the public feel welcome as part of the process and all staff feel appreciated. I was among those that saw some of these same characteristics on display as part of last year's school needs assessment committee. As a part of a group representing a wide cross-section of the community, Tim went from just asking a few questions and expressing some skepticism at a budget hearing to getting involved to try and find areas of common ground and to be part of a discussion to find solutions for a complex set of competing needs and priorities. School Board Chair Susanna Miso hubbs shared, while Tim and Nancy have long supported the schools, Tim's insights and energy for helping make the schools a safer and better place was evident in many discussions the committee held. His participation in the process garnered great respect from not only me, but my fellow board members and superintendent. Most importantly, Tim's contribution of time and thoughtfulness during this process will forever benefit our students and our schools. I read somewhere once that thriving communities are places filled with common people doing uncommon work for the common good. And that sometimes from overwhelming community challenges come tremendous community opportunities. I can think of no better example of this than Nancy and Tim Thompson and their work in our community. And it is with great pleasure that I have the honor of presenting them with the 2019 Ralph Gould Award for Outstanding Citizenship. Would you please join me in congratulating Nancy and Tim. Tim and Nancy have a few words. Um, we do have a, a nice gift for you, uh, a token of this award. So we hope you enjoy this and display it proudly in your, in your home. And uh, please, if you'd like to say a few words, please do. I didn't know we were supposed to have Come on, Tim, you're going to have to She is a spokesman for the group. <laughs> but uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier. And none of these the kind of things are ever won by a single person or two people. The comprehensive plan was obviously a team effort, and, and Penny was off, obviously one of those key people, but there were many others in the community. And over about a three-year period of time, when you include the selection process and finally getting it a, approved with the town council, uh, we got to know each other much better, and, uh, and we, we sometimes had to take a vote to move to the next, uh, but we found that to be a pretty effective tool. But uh, there was a great deal of camaraderie and caring for this community that came forward in that. I saw that in the facilities planning committee as well. Um, and uh, I think the other thing, the, the mental health initiative that we, we got involved with and got started and with Steve's help and, and Jamie mentioned several of the people that were key in town. The superintendent was 100% behind it. The principal, Troy over at the middle school, um, the, the social workers, the teachers, um, and especially, I'm so glad you mentioned uh, our nurse at the middle school, Jill, Jill Young, because mm -hmm. she is just such an asset in this town. She lives in this town. Her good kids go to school in this town, and she just she's going to be so valuable. She's young, so she's going to be around for a while, way <laughs> longer than me. But uh, none of these things are ever won by or presented to somebody that's by themselves. It's it's all of us working together, doing our civic duty, and we couldn't be prouder than to be part of this community. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> We told Tim and Nancy, too, that we'd put them first on the agenda so that they didn't have to sit through the rest of the, <laughs> the, tedious, the tedious work. So enjoy yourselves and congratulations. Um, next up, we'll move to town council reports and correspondence. Is there anybody that wishes to report anything or share any updates? 
seeing none. Um, I will add quickly that I um, attended the um, GPCOG Regional Voice Committee uh, meeting that was held this morning. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that came up and is relevant to recent discussions we had uh, last week um, is uh, GPCOG has to this point not really been involved uh, in any meaningful way on the issue of short-term rentals. Uh, communities haven't necessarily specifically asked them to. Um, I happen to bring up the workshop that we held last week and, and how we're uh, relooking at some of our own ordinance around that uh, particular issue. Um, and it, it did seem to spike some interest among some other communities as well. So um, as we continue to move through that process, um, that may be a resource that we're able to tap into um, for any variety of reasons. So uh, that's all I have on that. Um, next up, we're going to have a presentation from the Friends of Casco Bay. Mary Cerullo is going to share with us some information that she's brought to us. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, do, yeah, do you want to jump in first, Matt? I just want to yeah, turn on the uh, whole ramp. Oh, okay. Yeah. As well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yep. It's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Mary Cirillo tonight. I've known Mary for a number of years. Uh, we, uh, we've been uh, good, good friends for many, and uh, I know her background. And over the course of the summer, as the council may recall, uh, we received a, a bit of correspondence from, from residents regarding alternatives to uh, pesticide use uh, and what the, what the town's position was on that. As, as you may or may not know, the town has a policy where we, our first uh, approach is to try to go the organic route, uh, with the exception being when you found challenges that, that couldn't be met through those means. However, we don't have any uh, local ordinances that do address it, but trying to find a middle ground, I guess, uh, between an ordinance path versus uh, an education path, I felt this would be a great opportunity for us to to share uh, with, with the citizens of the town that there are alternatives out there and with Mary's background and specifically with her programming on bayscaping, uh, she was gracious enough to accept an invitation to come over this evening and try to, to bring more information so the council may have that as well as residents in the community can have a greater level of understanding and, and know what we're putting on the ground and what that, what that may impact. So uh, I'll get out of the way, but thank you, Mary, for coming over. Uh, thank you so much for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. Now, I used to be a neighbor. I lived on the other side of the line in South Portland. And you won't recognize this house because this is what it looked like when we moved in 40 years ago and it needed a new roof, new siding, new furnace, new kitchen, uh, new, new wiring and everything. And the only reason I agreed to move into this disaster of a house was that it was close to Willard Beach. Uh, and uh, even as my kids grew up and we had dandelions and uh, clover in the yard, uh, walking stick bugs in the driveway, we never forgot our connection to Casco Bay. Uh, and still today, uh, we still uh, pass that on to the next generation of Cerulos because Casco Bay really does begin in our backyard. And that's the reasoning behind why we started this program at Friends of Casco Bay uh, 20 years ago, um, to get people to recognize that what they do on their land has an impact on the ocean that we all value. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of why we're worried about pesticides and fertilizers and what some of the solutions that um, your neighbors are, are already doing. Uh, you know that pesticide means to kill, so you put it on your lawn to get rid of grubs and other things you don't want. Fertilizers are actually to make things grow, and in some cases they make things grow too well. Uh, and so whenever we saw these signs, we started to cringe because we knew that some of these pesticides were going into the bay, or at least we suspected it. Uh, so we did research uh, to verify whether or not pesticides were going into Casco Bay. So between 2001 and 2009, we sampled all around Casco Bay as uh, rainwater was washing uh, 
uh, off the land. And these are the chemicals you'll see through road down here. Um, we found diazinon 2,4-D. Those are both components of weed and feed. And we found it, in fact, all over the Casco Bay. And the reason we were doing this was because everything we do at Friends of Casco Bay is based on science. And we wanted to ascertain, is it really a problem as uh, pesticides and fertilizers are going into the bay? And this was enough for us to become concerned and to work with landscapers and residents to say, what can we do as an alternative? So we did not only research education, but we put up these nice signs to get people to recognize that their neighbors are not using fertilizers and pesticides. But we also worked with uh, lobster industry because certain classes of pesticides, pyrethroids specifically, uh, are really found to be dangerous to uh, not only the little amphipods you find in Kettle Cove and the tide pools, which are bottom of the food chain, but also juvenile and adult molting lobsters. So we worked with the main board of pesticides control to ascertain whether or not we were finding pyrethroids along the coast of Maine. And so we sampled South Portland uh, uh, streams, uh, Casco Bay, and the Board of Pesticides Control was actually most worried about the impact of uh, pyrethroids on lobster nursery grounds. And indeed, they were found. Uh, so people have been trying to limit those. So pesticide was one thing we were worried about. We were actually more worried about this, which uh, is actually a, a scientific term called the rise of slime, which means uh, too much nitrogen going into the ocean and uh, letting the plants in the ocean bloom. Now, all plants need nitrogen, uh, including the little tiny phytoplankton that you see there and uh, sinuous seaweeds, uh, but too much of a good thing is too much of a good thing. And uh, our volunteer monitors, many of whom were from Casco Bay, we just lost one of our favorites, Frank Levitt, who died here last week. Um, and our staff have sampled four um, parameters that uh, show us the health of Casco Bay, and nitrogen is a really important one. So from their data, we were able to pull together and find uh, where areas were where we're concerned about nitrogen runoff. And uh, indeed, it's primarily from rivers and urban areas, although way in the eastern Casco Bay is because there's so little circulation up there uh, from what runs off the land. Now, this is maybe a color that you'd want your lawn, but this is actually a cove in Falmouth, which is not the color that you want to see uh, growing there. Uh, so what happens is that rainwater flushes things off the land. This is a view from the Eastern Prom, and you see all that brown? That's actually sediment and other uh, pollutants that have been washed in after a really heavy storm. And in one case we sampled, and that wedge of uh, dirty water uh, went down 15 feet, which is a real challenge for the beasties trying to survive underneath. What happens uh, with excess nitrogen is that rainstorms wash it off the land, flushing it from factories and farms, although in Casco Bay, farms aren't really a big issue. Suburbia is, uh, and sewage treatment plants. What the nitrogen does in the ocean is the same thing that it does on land, is it makes things bloom. Uh, and if there's too much algal bloom, then you start to have problems. And excess nitrogen comes from sewage treatment plants, also from overflow. This is right under Commercial Street in Portland that shows you what happens every time there's a significant rainstorm. That floodgate opens up, and a combination of raw sewage and stormwater flushes into Casco Bay. And usually it's in, you may have heard about 9 million gallons spilling accidentally a couple summers ago. That same storm actually washed in lots more, millions of gallons on a normal basis from these. Uh, nitrogen also comes from atmospheric deposition, from tailgates, uh, tailpipes rather, and uh, uh, smokestacks. Uh, and pet waste, which maybe you'll be talking about later on tonight. Uh, and also, uh, for the purposes of tonight, from fertilizer. And the three uh, major components of fertilizers are nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And that's what these numbers on the bag mean. Uh, lakes, the uh, 
uh, component that triggers algal blooms in lakes is phosphorus, so that's what they're worried about. In Casco Bay and in the ocean, it tends to be nitrogen more than phosphorus. Some of you may recognize this. Anyone know where that is? That's Hannaford. It's Mill Cove behind the Hannaford supermarket. And that's what happens when you have too much nitrogen. Uh, it creates these thick mats uh, of green ulva that uh, prevent uh, the animals underneath from breathing and also prevents baby clams from settling. Uh, so what's underneath that four inch mat tends to smother. Uh, this is another uh, view of uh, Cove and Falmouth where too much nitrogen got washed into the bay. This looks like it could be Casco Bay Bridge, but fortunately it's Florida. Um, but I just put this in because we didn't want our ocean to look like that. And too much nitrogen is the cause of this uh, algal bloom in Florida. Too much nitrogen also is implicated in red tides, which are harmful algal blooms, and those are ones we're starting to find more of in Casco Bay, uh, not at the worrisome levels as you find in Florida uh, and the Gulf and other dead zones, but enough to be concerned about. And then once the algae grows, it dies, and when it dies, what happens? Anybody remember what it was like in around 1999 when uh, Eastern Casco Bay was covered in dead fish? Uh, what happened was the pogies went upstream, used up all the oxygen, and this is what results. So uh, as the bacteria break down the algae, that too uses up the oxygen and results in dead zones. And also what we're learning more about, and we're studying this at Friends of Casco Bay, is uh, af as the bacteria break down the algae, it also releases carbon dioxide into the water. And if you've heard of ocean acidification, which is making the water uh, about 30% more acidic than it was at the start of the Industrial Revolution, that has an implication on our shellfish, like these little baby clams that were put into acidic conditions. And within a week, uh, their shells started uh, to spot and deteriorate. And because it's it's an acid when it mixes with water and uh, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, uh, carbonic acid is what you find in uh, uh, dissolving limestone caves and places like that. And it actually can dissolve shellfish too. So those are the reasons that we're concerned about too much nitrogen in Casco Bay. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, citizen groups have started to form. Different communities are passing ordinances. You may have heard that South Portland and Portland uh, now restrict uh, pesticides. South Portland has just passed an ordinance that they're having a committee design uh, uh, regulations to restrict the use of uh, fertilizer on residential properties and town properties. Uh, and also, you can set an example for your neighbors. So, for example, Citizens for Green Scarborough got uh, playing fields to stop using pesticides. Harpswell has uh, ordinances that prevent certain chemicals from going being used near the shoreline because lobsters are a big product of uh, residents of Harpswell. <clears throat> Kennebunk has its own uh, campaign, Lawns for Lobsters, that's been very successful, getting to people to reduce their use of lobsters. Camden uses cute little kids to get people to think about restricting lawn chemicals. South Portland, bees, bays, and backyards. Falmouth is this one. Uh, and then we want people to think about Casco Bay and to think about how they can reduce their dependence on pesticides and fertilizers on uh, primarily lawns uh, and playing fields for recreational use. So educating people is the key and that's why we have this basecaping program. We go to socials at people's houses or civic groups or uh, you know, one or more persons that are, are willing to sit and, and talk about it. Uh, it's called basecaping, and uh, we 
get people to start thinking about how they use their lawns different times of the year. Now winter is coming in and you're not going to be able to do much with your lawn pretty soon, but you think about how you use your lawn. Do you want a house party? Do you want it just to look nice for the neighbors or do you not want any lawn at all? Those are the choices you can be thinking about over the winter. In the spring, we encourage people to pull the weeds while the ground is still wet and the weeds aren't established. Sharpen your mower blades and turn over the soil and aerate it. Simple things to prepare your lawn for the uh, heavy kinds when you're cutting your lawn to three to three and a half inches, watering maybe once or twice a week to a depth of one inch to one and a half inches. These are all things that we put out in our basecaping materials and people can just look at that. And this is basically organic lawn care. Uh, the most important thing anybody can do uh, is to do a soil test every three to five years. Find out if you needed to put anything on your lawn. Um, materials, we have soil test kits at Friends of Casco Bay offices, Cumberland County. Uh, Extension gives them away for free and then you fill out a form and uh, uh, they will tell you if you need to put anything on your lawn. Now this is the time of year where we're encouraging people uh, late summer, early fall to think about putting your lawn to bed, uh, using compost uh, to spread over your soil and then spray it with uh, uh, seeds that are like ryegrass and uh, fescues. Uh, and then when you mow your lawn, maybe the last time, you leave some of your uh, leaves uh, munched up, crunched up to fertilize for the winter. All simple things people can do on their lawns that actually have an impact. But probably the most important thing is just to keep water on your lawn. If you have a rain garden or a pavement where the water soaks in or buffer plants between your lawn and the ocean or rain barrels, those are all ways to infiltrate and keep uh, water on the lawn, that water that may contain uh, chemicals you don't want going into the, uh, into the ocean. So when you think about it, who is the hardest group to convince to do, you know, little, little on their lawn as possible? Uh, possibly your neighbors, uh, because lawn care professionals know how to do it, they're willing to do it, but people don't ask, which is why we started this program uh, aimed at residents. Um, so what do you say to your neighbor when you're trying to get them to stop using uh, pesticides and fertilizers? There's different strategies to find your shared values. For example, did you know that bees are, uh, depend on dandelions as their first food of spring? Uh, or appeal to the olden days. You know, we always used to have clover on our lawns before. Now, uh, you know, why don't we go back to that? Because they're a natural fertilizer. Or, you know, civic pride. South Portland has an ordinance restricting the use of pesticides. Maybe we should think about that. Uh, or, in the case of tonight, appeal to the dogs because uh, there are studies that have shown that dogs that are raised on chemically treated lawns by professional are seven times more likely to have um, canine, uh, what do you call it, uh, serious cancer. Uh, and so uh, dogs are especially vulnerable to lawn chemicals. Or you could just say, here, let me give you a soil test kit or uh, a basecaper sign, uh, but we know that not everybody is going to be convinced. There are people who love their lawns and they have to be pristine. Unfortunately, it also seems sometimes they're the ones that live right by the ocean and we're trying to talk them out of it. One of my colleagues at work has this rule, 20-60-20, which means in any group, there's probably 20% of the people who are all with you. 60% of the people probably don't even know what you're talking about or are just slightly interested. And then there are 20% of the people that no matter how you give them the facts, they're not going to believe you. So that's the group that you just say, how about those patriots? <laughs> and, you know, you're never going to convince anyone, but there are a lot of people who are willing to think about the fact that it really does take a community uh, to get people to change the world. And we're at a point where we really need all the help citizens can provide. So thank you for listening tonight. I have lots of materials I can share with you all uh, at future times. And I left packets with some of our background information there. But 
Friends of Casco Bay is just over on the SMCC campus. If you ever want us to deliver materials or come visit us. And uh, thank you for letting me be part of your evening. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, I appreciate the work that you and your organization do and for educating us here tonight. Does anybody have any questions? There's no specific action we're looking to take right now, but does anybody have any questions while Mary's here? Or? Take advantage of our time. No. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the information. Thanks. Next up, we'll have uh, the Finance Committee report. Council Straw. Uh, so you should all have the appropriation and revenue controls and the expense and revenue distributions along with the dashboard. Uh, nothing really to highlight this month. Um, I did want to touch on one item that came up last month uh, just to provide a little more clarity. Uh, so the Portland Headlight gift shop sales numbers on the dashboard um, were lower than anticipated. So the question was, are the, the various changes we've been making have any impact on sales? Um, and uh, the town manager, and correct me if I get any of this wrong, uh, and our finance director uh, were looking into things basically be behind the scenes where we were uh, missing about a week's worth of cash deposits. And basically, it's just in this dashboard view that they're not showing up. It's all in the accounting system. It's just when things are being uh, reconciled and what month they're being allocated to. So what's happening is we have a portion of our cash receipts from July are falling into August from a bookkeeping perspective. Likewise, a portion of our August receipts are falling into September from a bookkeeping perspective. So we're seeing a, uh, a shift of about a week of cash receipts uh, as the year goes on from one month to the next. Um, and it has to do with how the bookkeeping's happening behind the scenes. So that's why the numbers were a little off, it looked like, last month. And we'll continue to see that uh, as we progress here. Uh, and hopefully I got that right. And yeah, yeah, it comes down to uh, when the deposits were booked. Uh, ultimately, so with the, the last week of July being a split week, uh, it came on board in the first week of August. So uh, you'll notice that this month the numbers are, are tracking a lot more closely to what we are uh, had historically last year. Right. Uh, so, any questions on any of that? I yep. Go ahead, ben. I don't have a question. I, um, I just know over the last uh, several weeks, I've had. Uh, uh, questions about the uh, pay and display and the fact that uh, uh, dollars are going into the, the general fund. And I just thought it would be a good opportunity to reiterate publicly how we came to a decision and how those dollars are targeted. And I thought Matt might be able to do that for us. If I may, Chair. Sure. Uh, th thank you, Councilor Jordan. That's a, it, this is a great opportunity to, <clears throat> excuse me, come back to the statement of policy that the council approved uh, this summer and uh, the initial statement of policy that the council approved regarding revenues generated from the Fort Williams Pan Display Parking Programs is ultimately stating that it will be employed for the following, primarily offsetting the operational expenses and capital improvements for Fort Williams long-term capital needs of the town and general municipal operating expenses. So that ultimately you know, identifies that the operations of the fort really is the primary need and uh, looking at what we anticipate to spend and invest into the fort over the year. Uh, this, you could almost look at a one for one. It's still that we will not be generating the amount of revenue to offset the full expense of operations of Fort Williams Park. But this definitely, you can see how the relationship exists but between the two. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Yep, you're welcome. If I, if I may as well take this opportunity to, looking at the dashboard, you'll notice this month I did also add on uh, the net revenues uh, that were generated after expenses. Uh, so we had the gross. You can see that we had uh, over the first two months roughly $247,000 in gross receipts through the pay and display parking program. Uh, and then the net that we had was at 78,800. Uh, that was for the month of July. That also was uh, had a greater level of expenses than you would have found or will find in August because we had uh, 
the initial expenses of, the, of getting the program started. So there was materials and other equipment that we needed to purchase as part of the program to, to place the units into, into there. So we'll see a better net revenue performance in the month of August and I'll receive those numbers shortly once they reconcile the, the month's uh, receipts. But we are definitely tracking where we, uh, you know, where we want to be. And so to reiterate with that, basically the numbers we're seeing on the dashboard for paying display net revenue do not yet include the August numbers, Correct. much like how the gift shop sales are also missing a small fraction of the August numbers. So basically the money is there, it's just from a reporting standpoint, it's showing up in the next, uh, the next cycle. Yeah. So we'll that's probably the key part. About a month behind on, yeah. the, uh, on the parking revenues. Are there any questions for Councilor Straw? Thank you, Chris. Is there any citizen here that uh, wishes to speak to something that's not on the agenda tonight? If you are interested, please come forward. Seeing none, we'll move to the town manager's monthly report. Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just need a moment to change no my screen. <laughs> I'd like to open my manager's report by reminding all that school is back in session. Uh, and please be aware of school bus traffic, increased pedestrians in the town center, and please let's all be safe. Applications for the Senior Citizen Property Tax Relief Program are now available on the town's website. You can also get them at the assessor's office, or if you choose to not use either of those options, they will be happy to mail one uh, to you as well. You just have to call uh, the tax assessor's office at 799-1619 to, to request that. And the applications are due on or before November 15th with a maximum benefit of up to $500. On September 28th, the town will be partnering with Dr. Ginger Brown Johnson and the Veterinarian Rehabilitation Center of Cape Elizabeth in providing discount rabies vaccinations at the picnic shelter at Fort Williams. And this is an observation of World Rabies Day. The event will be held in the morning and will be available for both dogs and cats. More detailed information will be posted shortly on the website. So uh, we're looking at this as a great opportunity for the public health, uh, for a public health benefit. And finally, the town held its annual employee training and appreciation day on August 15th. This is a well attended event by the staff with an emphasis on mandatory annual training in harassment, as well as specialized training in customer service. This was followed by the annual luncheon where longevity awards were presented to staff and of significant anniversaries celebrated were Public Works Director Robert Malley and Public Works Supervisor Jim Green with both achieving 40 years of service to the town. It's quite a milestone. Congratulations to them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was my manager's report for tonight. Thank you. Any questions for Matt? Um, I just want to add one thing before we move to the rest of the agenda um, and pass along uh, condolences on behalf of the community to the family of Wayne Murray, uh, who passed away recently. Um, Wayne uh, grew up in Cape, went to Cape schools, and after coming home from the Navy, um, uh, was a successful businessman here. And um, importantly, he was a long-term member of the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department and uh, worked his way up to chief uh, in the mid-60s to the late 70s. Um, he was also a five-term member of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, and uh, probably one of his most visible uh, contributions to that was that during that time, um, he was very active in uh, getting the statue erected uh, that honors uh, Olympic champion Joan Benoit uh, for her accomplishments that's in front of the library. So on behalf of the town and on behalf of the council, we pass along our condolences to the family of Mr. Murray. Um, moving on, we'll go to the review of the draft minutes of the meeting held on August 12th, 2019. Is there a motion? Motion to approve by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. Next up, uh, we're gonna have a public hearing on a request to amend the sewer service area at 38 Broad Cove Road. Uh, if there's anybody that wishes to speak on this item, uh, please come forward, give us your name and your address and or affiliation, and we'll be happy to hear from you. Uh, I'm the guy, I'm Randall Wild, <laughs> and it's my application to be allowed to have access to the sewer system. Um, it, for those who don't know, it's in the southern part of the Cape on Broad Cove Road, and it sits behind the lots that go along Broad Cove Road. Uh, the driveway to our property actually is part of the system. Uh, our house is sitting behind it. It has been on a septic uh, field for 
at least 30 years, uh, and I'm thinking it's not long for this world. And I'd much prefer, rather than renew the septic field, to go on to the sewer system, because I think it's a better solution for uh, uh, that, that kind of issue. And you know, it sort of goes along with the presentation from the Friends of Casco Bay as well. So I would uh, respectfully ask the council uh, to approve the request uh, that the planning board has already reviewed. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Um, so for item number 131-2019, the request to amend the sewer service area at 38 Broad Cove Road. Is there any discussion from the council or anybody willing to make a motion? I Count move that we approve the request. Councilor Randall makes a motion. Is there a second? Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you very much. Next up is item number 125-2019, proposed amendments to chapter seven uh, uh, dogs ordinance. Um, we'll first have an opportunity for public comment. Um, I wanna remind uh, the public and see a number of folks here that I imagine are here to speak about this, that we have had a public hearing um, at which uh, we uh, had unlimited time for folks to come forward and talk about this. We've also, I wanna acknowledge, received a number of emails on this topic. Um, I'd say, um, if I had to estimate even just today, probably at least a dozen or more than that. Um, and I would guess the overwhelming uh, opinion of the emails that we've received is um, to move forward with uh, the recommendations as they've been presented. We've heard from some nuanced views of that, but I, I think that fairly characterizes uh, the, the bulk of the emails we've gotten. So I say all that, uh, welcoming your public comment, but um, I, I don't think that we're all that interested to move beyond the 15 minute public comment period. So if there's lots of folks that wanna speak, if you could maybe keep your comments pretty limited or to maybe things that we haven't yet heard from or opinions that we haven't heard from. So with that, if anybody wants to speak, come on forward. This is your name and your address or affiliation. And like I said, try and limit your comments to certainly no more than three minutes, but if you can be more economical, all the better. Is there anybody that wishes to speak? Good evening. My name's Richard Armstrong, 2 Waverly Road. Um, I know this issue has been going around and around. We've been to several hearings uh, the, the, uh, with the Ordinance Committee, the, the Conservation Committee, the Park Committee, and it seems like in January, you passed a resolution to have the dog park um, off limits at the, at, the, at the ball field and extended down by the lawn. And for most of it, I'm speaking for myself, but I believe most of the uh, dog owners like that the way it is. Having the ball field is not mandatory, and we understand why you don't want to do that. But what we're concerned about is having no place for our dogs to be off leash. Now, to give you an idea, we have a lot of people that walk their, or have their dogs down there off leash that are in their 70s and 80s. I know I don't look that old, but I am. <laughs> and in inclement weather, it's very difficult to walk your dog off leash in Robinson Woods or wherever you're gonna go. And the park is nice because the, the uh, uh, roads are open, we can get through, we're able to clean up after our dogs, and it seems like it's working. And it, uh, from my perspective, I don't understand why this is bouncing back and forth, because you passed a resolution in January of 2018, which I think everybody liked. Now it's being addressed again, and I'm confused as to why that's being looked at again. Could that be explained to us by someone? You want to explain it? Uh, the, after the public comment period, we'll have a discussion. Okay, could, if you could do that, that would be great. It would be helpful to us. But uh, just the people that use the park for their dogs, there are people that don't use their parks for their dogs, that enjoy having the dogs up there. It's a soothing thing. It's almost like a, having a, uh, uh, what do they call those dogs? 
<laughs> therapy dogs for people. And people seem to enjoy it. It's really a nice environment, and people who have dogs, for the most part, who are Cape residents, are very responsible for picking up. And we even pick up for other people's dogs. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank Armstrong. You. Others that wish to come forward to speak on this? My name is Roger Rio. I live at Five Bridal Pathway. And uh, maybe a point of explanation of what he asked about is I, I also am a member of the uh, Little League in Cape Elizabeth and am pushing for dogs not being allowed on athletic fields to review. It damages the field. Children have to be on the field. The dogs don't need to be on the field. There are places to go. I would encourage there to be, continue to be an off-leash area. I have a dog and we love her and we walk her in the park always on a leash because if we let her free, we, she doesn't come back. So um, that, that hopefully that explains part of it. And, but the port, most important thing is that dogs, that the feces of the dog retained stay there. And the point in that reference is the algae bloom in South Portland. I don't know if you saw that. It was in the paper, Hinkley Park. And the dogs were being uh, poisoned by the algae in the bloom. They were drinking the water or swimming in the water. So it is a danger. And they, their assessment is it was partially made worse by dog feces. Recently, I looked in the pond at Fort Williams. There is algae in the upper part near the children's garden. So my encouragement to all of you is athletic fields, athletic facilities, i.e. tennis courts, and children's playgrounds ought to be off limits for dogs, even on leash. Yes, we pick up the feces, but some remnants stay there. Urine, you don't pick up and they are contaminants that harm other dogs and they harm and can harm the children. So again, I would encourage, you know, encourage let's find a place where, and continue to have a place where dogs can be off leash, but children's playgrounds and facility, and athletic facilities is not that place. Thank you. Thank you. Any others that wish to come forward? I'm uh, Donna Lamberth. I live at 11 Apple Tree Lane. And um, I, I, too, am struggling a little bit with figuring out whether the off-leash area at Fort Williams is at risk or not. And I know I'd kind of kick myself if it was at risk and I hadn't said something. So um, I guess what I'd like you to know about it is that um, that's a place in our town that is just incredible in terms of um, a community being able to come together, people of all ages, all backgrounds, um, and uh, you know, just just be together in a place that's very unstructured. You rarely see people with their cell phones. Um, yesterday afternoon was a great example. There were probably maybe um, 10 to 15 community members just out on the, that big field out in front of the headlight, kind of talking about how it was such a beautiful day. You could see Seguin light. Um, dogs were playing. People were just having a great time, really enjoying the park. Um, we know that we get millions of visitors to the park every year, and that's great. Um, but that area in particular is a place where year-round, all weather, um, people from our community who pay taxes in Cape Elizabeth take advantage of the beauty of the park, and it's just a great opportunity for all of us to get together. So I hope you'll respect that and um, agree to preserve that. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, there are a lot of great things that happen in Cape Elizabeth, but so many of them are really structured. And um, this is a place that's very different from that, and um, I think it's really a, an important um, place for people in town to come together. And uh, again, I hope you'll preserve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Mark Swartz, 17 Pleasant Avenue, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I think we all, everybody that walks the dog down there appreciates the fact we expanded the lower part of the field so we could all get away from the, the ball fields and the, the 
t-ball area and stuff. And we would have no problem staying away from all the fields and all that, but we would like to have the area down below preserved because it is just such a nice area and everybody down there is so nice. And it's just a really convenient place to go. And, and you know, I know myself and everybody down there, we do pick up after our dogs and other people that don't pick up after their dogs, we'll pick up after them for them. So we just, you know, that's what got me confused is why is all the turmoil over the dog park? That's, you know, maybe you could answer that question for me later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Myers. I live at 4 Sea View. I'm part of the 20-60-20 that Mary Cirillo <laughs> mentioned. Um, figure out which one. <laughs> I'm sure you are as well. 20-60-20, <laughs> I'm all for it. Anyway, um, what I, I, I think, as you know, I'm supportive of the um, ordinance that has been drafted, and there's just some minor tweaks. I, I think the, the sense of um, the concern at Fort Williams has been one of the ones that's been of the most of, of most interest to, to many, and I don't know that anyone's really, um, as you re review the proposal, I, I don't think there's an, I see um, significant adjustment to the off-leash areas or the uh, on-leash areas within Fort Williams with the exception of the athletic field. It seems to me that there might be some reasonable consensus that that athletic field doesn't need to have dogs on it if there's adequate space other ways, other ways and it appears that there might be. More to um, this notion, I, I've um, been hearing and reading and listening that we are somehow being more restrictive to um, dogs. And I just want to um, observe that uh, if you look at the um, category designations, there's almost uh, over, a little over a thousand acres of town land that falls under the ordinance. That's to say the land that the town controls. We're not talking about the land trust or other places, but just the, 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 that the town controls. And in that, if you look at, the, in all those open space properties, that total acreage, there's only one location in all of them where dogs are not allowed at all, and it's like 0.03 acres. There's only two sites that have um, dogs must be on a leash. And then there's um, uh, three sites, uh, Fort Williams, Cliff House Beach, and what's the third one? Um, don't tell me. Where, where? tell me. Oh, Goldcrest, yeah. Well, the, the, uh, where it's mixed. There's three, so three, where, but in all those cases where they're mixed use, there's, uh, there are always times or seasons of the, uh, uh, that dogs are allowed to be um, essentially off leash. Um, and unrestricted. That, that means that over 99.6% of the total property that falls under the ordinance has opportunities for um, dogs to be off leash at some time during the day. To me, that in, you know, that's like an A plus in my book, and I think that's a there's plenty there are enough, enough options that um, that that should be available to, to people. Also, I think that this. Um, suggests to me that it's not unreasonable to suggest that athletic fields could be um, placed in a, all, all of the athletic fields in category one all the time. Um, also, I, I want to remind folks, to, and at least I have to be mindful, that this isn't against dogs. This is really, in my view, it's, all, it's, you know, it's about people. And that's to say that I know that, um, and I you may be one of those people that I think, I, you know, I like my dog. I treat his member of my family. I did um, when I had my dog. He, you know, we let him do all the kinds of things, roll around the floor, sleep in the, you know, sleep. And as long as that is in your own home and in your own space and you know the animal and you've been able to, to care for it and, and have make sure it's up to snuff with vet, uh, shots that have fleas or if it does have fleas, take care of it so that when your kids are playing with a dog, you know what you've got. That's okay in a private space. What we're talking about is public space, and not everyone considers their dog to be a member of family. Some people are afraid of dogs for whatever reason. Um, they might not like the dog jumping on them or sniffing them or whatever and um, slobbering. So if that's the case, um, you know, we just need to prioritize people and realize that the reasonable um, druthers of some people um, should be respected in a public space. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> so
So Heidi Hansen, 313 Fowler Road. I'd like to first ask a question. Is there a rule about town councilors not participating in hearings in committees prior to it coming to the town council? Say that again? Because the reason I'm asking that question is this, as Richard Armstrong said, this has been out since February. I've been to like way too many hearings and um, I think it's been a good process, but it seems like, and, and Penny, you ran great ordinance committee meetings. We did some really good changes to fine tune this stuff, but it seems like then all of a sudden it comes to the town council and we're sitting before the kings and queens of England and you guys get to decide some new stuff. And it's, it's really difficult for a citizen to participate in this process when there are so many um, possible changes to an ordinance that we've worked through for five or six months. And um, I just wanted to just mention that that's a problem, I think. Um, I, I think the people at Fort Williams Park are exhausted. And, um, and with this ordinance, we still may be exhausted because we don't have as many um, protections as we did under the previous ordinance. That said, I do support this ordinance. I think it's a great ordinance. Um, I think that the property management plan is extremely innovative and takes kind of the politics out of it and, and keeps the property managers who know what's going on best to manage the properties. Um, and um, just one other thing, I, I did write a letter to you all last before last meeting and um, as much as some people think that dog waste is a, a public health issue, it's really not. Um, and if you do believe it's a public health issue with children particularly, um, uh, I have consulted with a very well respected um, epidemiologist, which is infectious disease and um, and showed her the CDC pages of the possible diseases that you can get from dog waste or cat waste for that matter. And to legislate not having dog waste around anywhere, um, even remnants of it is like saying, if you have children, you can't have pets. Um, and if you have children you're, and you do have dogs, don't let them sleep with them, please. Um, so it's, it's a little bit, no, it's a lot. It's a lot overblown in terms of the health issues and I don't think that that is a reason for anyone to think about um, where dogs should be on leash or off leash. And just one final point, if I can, um, to the point that I, I do agree, there's a ton of off leash areas in this town, but there are not a ton of off leash areas that are plowed and maintained. And that's very, very, very important, particularly to older people and people who have handicaps. And so you should consider that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? All right, seeing none, um, I've got two housekeeping items on this issue before we move on to discussion. Uh, the first of which is um, <laughs> one that wasn't going to be relevant for me until two days ago, but um, I am now a brand new dog owner and in the past have been um, part of the Dogs of the Light group, some of whom are members here and have advocated for this. Um, so up until this point, I haven't had a conflict of interest or a potential conflict of interest, but I wanted to disclose that to everybody um, so that you were aware at least. So I'll put that out there. I'll simply note I'm a dog owner as well, so uh, I don't think that would rise, but. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, so if nobody has any concerns, we'll move on from that. The second housekeeping item is I'm looking for somebody to make a motion to take off the table this item which we placed on the table on August 12th. So moved. Moved by Councilor Caitlin Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Penny Jordan, the item is off the table. 
so, uh, I'm looking for either council discussion or somebody to make a motion, um, uh, as we've enumerated here in the agenda. Um, there's been, and you've heard here tonight, there's been numerous meetings uh, on this particular topic from Conservation Committee, which voted out five to nothing to recommend the ord uh, amendments to the dog ordinance. Um, the ordinance committee, after having the item referred to it by the council in May, also unanimously voted uh, to recommend the amendments to the council. At the July 8th meeting, uh, we voted to change category one um, to be inclusive of the athletic fields and held a public hearing on August 12th. And uh, here we are tonight. So. Can I? Go ahead, Penny. I wasn't going to make a motion right now. Um, but I think there some, seems to be confusion about the off-leash area at the yep. fort. I think that's a good point, and we heard some questions from the public that probably it, deserve because addressing. Because that, that, uh, that isn't going to be impacted. Uh, it stays as it is. Unless there was a change to the athletic field designation. Right, yep. right. And, uh, but there's, there seems to be confusion there. Yep. And the, the other thing that keeps coming up, and I wonder if there might be a, uh, a compromise point or something that we as a town need to really be looking at, is that do we need to have additional areas for off-leash that are accessible? Uh, because I, I read, uh, uh, all, actually I read all of the emails, but the, the ones that are most poignant from my perspective are the fact that we have uh, people who are aging in our community who have dogs who want to still be able to take their dogs to uh, enjoy the company of other dogs. It's a great social um, uh, time for people who might uh, be retired or whatever, but is that something that we kind of want to look at uh, as an adjunct to this. Um, because it seems to me that the contention around athletic fields is because there's no alternative. But if we can create alternatives, I think we can um, have a more compromised position. Okay. Um, just one second, I, I want to also address a couple of the points that came up in the public comment. The first thing was sort of a general question of why are we doing this, um, and I'll be as concise as I can on that. Um, back in the late winter, early spring thereabouts, um, we were looking at some other items, um, and there was just an overall inconsistency, uh, I think, that um, stood out in terms of what... Um, you know, what areas of town could be used in certain ways with or without dogs and all that kind of thing. And so um, really actually in the context of um, some of the changes to the management plan that were being recommended for Cliff House Beach, uh, we said, okay, well, let's work on that uh, in a, as quick a manner as we can with the summer upcoming and, and the high season there, but concurrently also look more broadly um, at uh, you know, the entire dog ordinance and its impact in other areas of town. So um, that, I hope, answers the question of why this came up and why we are discussing this. Um, uh, another point, I, I, think, um, I think, Heidi, what you were asking, which I just want to address for a second, is, you know, if, if there are meetings going on and, and discussions being had about this, you, you feel like that it's coming to this point we're sort of starting from square one. Is that what I'm sort of... No, I'm just suggesting that yeah. there have been numerous discussions um, and the topic of athletic fields yeah. has not been discussed. And yet, at the same time, there are town councilors who are proposing new changes to the ordinance that weren't yeah. present. So, um, yeah. So I just want to I just want to iterate that all of us um, are certainly entitled to attend any meeting, just like any other member of the public would be. Um, all of us, I know, uh, do a good job of following along on those meeting proceedings, whether it be through reading minutes or you know talking to people on those committees or things like that. So um, you know it's our responsibility to be informed and you know abreast of all the information surrounding the issues. Um, so uh, I can assure you that counselors take that responsibility seriously and, and, and do stay attuned to those particulars. I would also say that, you know, through the years there's been points made that when counselors come and attend at the committee level that it brings sort of 
an unnecessary or undue um, emphasis on their point of view, should they have one, um, that can interfere with um, the working process of crafting ordinance or language or, or coming to decisions on things. So it's a delicate balance that we try to strike, but um, I just wanted to make you try and ease your concern that people aren't paying attention or engaged or, or concerned about it. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up and remind, I'm reminded of the fact that at the um, August 12th meeting, Council Gabrielson suggested that we um, potentially sort of bifurcate these two things so that we're, t we're voting on the ordinance, but then also um, as we did with um, both the Cliff House Beach Plan and um, we've done you know, with other um, town properties, uh, trails and whatnot, um, separately um, approve uh, whatever the management plan uh, winds up being that gets assigned to this. So those are two potentially separate things where um, the core of the ordinance is one thing, but then particulars around the management plan um, uh, are separate. So anyway, I think I got that out of the way. Um, I'm going to go, Valerie, you had a point you wanted to make? Or? I did, but were you going to respond to something that Jamie just said? No. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. Don't forget it. Well, I'm going to come to that I one. Just, I go in. What did he say? No. <laughs> oh, thank you, Penny. <laughs> I just um, talked about us paying attention to <laughs> <laughs> So I just had two points I wanted to make. One is that I was getting all these emails, and I read all of the emails as well, about um, people's concerns about losing the off-leash space at Fort Williams. And I was thinking, why is there this concern? And then my neighbor came up to me and he's like, why are you guys trying to take away the off-leash space? So I looked back at the Fort Williams Park Committee meeting minutes and I noticed that in May, they and I remember this now, that we had discussed this previously and it had sort of, in, in the whole ordinance thing, I had sort of forgotten about that, that they were talking about limiting the off-leash space. So I want to clarify for everyone tonight, that's not what we're talking about, but now I understand your concern about losing off-leash space and, and also that concern about losing particularly the paved off-leash space. So that was one thing, and then let me see if I can remember the other. Um, oh, about the process. Um, I wanted to respond to, to Ms. Hansen's concern about how long the process is and why it's been dragged out like this and to note that I think one of the things we were concerned about and part of it is that just this just is the process of crafting an ordinance and it's long and drawn out. But the other part was that we thought that this particular issue um, warranted discussion of the full council and we wanted to have it in a council setting rather than in an ordinance meeting because not a lot of people know to come to ordinance meetings and some of you did and that was wonderful and it made the process um, so much easier, difficult in some ways but easier in other ways. Um, but I thought it was super productive to have so many participants at those meetings, but a lot of people don't know to come. So we've definitely gotten more feedback now that it's come to the full council. And even though it seems like we're just unnecessarily dragging it out and making you come to meeting after meeting, it is helpful to us to have that much feedback. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. Um, one of the other things I wanted to clarify and um, my fellow ordinance committee members uh, pipe in, when we talked about dogs relative to athletic fields, it was dogs can attend athletic events on leash. They just can't, uh, uh, would not be on the field. Because one of our concerns is that as people say, the dog is like a member of their family, which I understand totally. So uh, when the kids are at, the, at athletic events, as long as the dog is on leash and not on, physically on the field, they can sit on the sidelines with the rest of the family members. And I just wanna make sure that that's clear so that people aren't feeling that they can't bring their dogs to the athletic events. Other comments or discussion? or motion. 
Uh, just quick comment on that. Uh, we do need, though, to deal with a bunch of inconsistencies in the property management categories. That is one of them where it can be interpreted in different ways. So we do need to clarify those as part of this. But I still like uh, uh, Councillor Gabrielson's uh, concept. We break these two apart because I think it, the rules are generally acceptable. It's how do we categorize the various parts of town. Okay, cool. Um, yep. If I may, there's uh, speaking with Maureen in advance of this as well, mm -hmm. as the council does move forward with making motions regarding the ordinance part, it was uh, just in the desire of further clarity is that as this is adopted, that this would automatically update applicable provisions of the management plan. So. Uh, Earlier this year, the Cliff House Beach management plan w was brought forward. This would, I mean, they're b basically identical, but this would kind of be the new master uh, ordinance that when it would come to all of the properties. So I just want to make sure that uh, the council is observant of that and that it's clear to the public as well. It's, this is just kind of basically replacing it with the, the ma like the master ordinance, right. if, if that makes sense. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Other comments? Valerie? Um, one thing, I, I think that with Penny's comment that we do need to clarify if dogs are allowed on athletic fields or not, um, because we're saying no dogs at all, and now we're saying dogs if they're on leash with On families. the sidelines, not on the field. Okay, well, but we have to figure out what sidelines mean, because um, there's people sitting out there, there's children playing, um, dogs still um, can urinate and use the field as a toilet. We so I think that that's something that we're taking into consideration here when we're saying no dogs on athletic fields. And I think that needs to be really clear. Um, the other thing I'd like to address um, is your comment about all of the committees. Um, I did tend the, um, attend the Fort Williams. Could you speak into your microphone, please? Sure. Can you hear me better? I did tend the, attend the Fort Williams um, committee meeting regarding dogs because I felt it was really important for me to hear what Cape residents, what their concerns were. So I was there, but I didn't, um, I wasn't part of the committee, so I was in the audience just like everyone else. So I think at times you'll find counselors at meetings. You might not know they're there because they're not um, taking part in the discussion, but I felt that it was important to see um, how many people attended and what they had to say. So um, sometimes we will be at those meetings and you might not realize it. Um, and then are we going to do some clarification on the ordinance or are we just voting on this, this is the ordinance the way we want it or is there going to be some clarification still? Um, the floor is open for a motion to either adopt the ordinance as presented, make modifications or amendments to it. Um, again, I think the most prudent way to proceed is focused on the ordinance followed by the management plan. I, I would make a motion that we adopt the amendments to the Chapter 7 dog ordinance as presented in the agenda. There's a motion from Council Gabrielson. Is there a second? Second it. Councilor Jordan. Discussion. <coughs> Councilor Devereaux. Um, at, at our last meeting, I talked about um, leash, and I, I see that um, Maureen gave us a couple more definitions of leash as it appears in um, other town ordinances close by. Um, my concern is 30 feet, I think, is um, way too long. Uh, if somebody's walking their dog on the street, the width of the street, is that 30 feet? Is it? It's not even 30 feet, is it? Is Shore Road 30 no. feet wide? Mm -hmm. Shore Road's not even 30 feet wide, so a leash that's 30 feet, um, it to me seems very, very long. And I noticed that the other ordinances tend to say um, between six feet and 14 feet for a leash. Also, in our ordinance, we say that if a dog is on voice control, that um, any dog cannot come within 10 feet of a person or maybe somebody else's other dog unless they've invited them there or said, please come up. If you've got a leash that's 30 feet, how do you keep that dog um, 10 feet from someone? That, that's a concern to me because I have seen, um, I've walked with people who have little dogs and 
uh, other dogs have come at them when they're on a leash. And um, it's a, it seems to be a problem. So I was concerned about the length of that leash. I'm also concerned about, I don't see any fines in here. Um, we have licensing requirements, and I'm sure that most everyone in Cape licensed their dogs. But there are some people who don't, and maybe they haven't gotten their rabies shots. Maybe there's other things that they aren't taking care of their dogs. Is there a fine for people who have not licensed their dogs? Oh, yes. I don't see it in this ordinance. It's, it's under the state law. Uh, regarding, uh, there's a whole process that's that's laid out. Uh, Deborah and her staff will uh, will go through that each year to try to do the up updates as people renew. If they do not renew, there is a bit of a grace period after the start of the year, okay. and if they go out beyond that, then uh, the court system takes over and it gets more expensive uh, as it goes on. But those are all set out by by state statute. Okay, and and the same for dogs at large. If um, if there's a dog at large. Uh, is there a fine? I didn't see that in the ordinance either. Um, do we have fines for that? There, there are there are fines. That's under I think municipal offenses, under the police department. Okay, because on the last page it says penalties, and I was just concerned because um, the penalties are um, uh, five hundred up to $500 to be recovered by complaint, so that means we'd have to hire an attorney to file a complaint to sue someone for $500. Um, it just seemed that maybe a fine would be easier than filing a complaint and taking someone to court. So just some thoughts. Um, Is it a complaint citation? Yes, yeah. it's not, I don't think it's, uh, it would be like receiving a ticket. Yeah, uh, like, a, through the like an appearance person. warrant or something for speeding, for example. They, they use the term complaint, but it's really, it's a, it's a violation that would be written up by the by the. So policeman. it would be a police um, or our code enforcement officer writing someone up. Uh, most likely, animal control, okay. animal control officer, or one of our other, uh, yeah, one of our other policemen. Okay, because I was just concerned that that seemed like. Um, a uh, big process for, for a fine, that something we could do as a fine. So um, I guess my main concern then is really the 30 feet length seems really long to me for a leash length. Mm -hmm. Okay, other discussion? Council Randall? Um, is the motion on the table to approve just the ordinance, not the designation? Yep. So yep. one of my thoughts about that was that if we want to do a broad restriction, so for example, one thing that I was thinking about is what if we say no dogs within the lined portion of athletic fields from April 1st to November 1st? That might be something that we would rather have in the actual ordinance rather than in the categories because it could be a little more clear that way um, if we're going to break it down. I mean, that was one of my ideas was that if we want to say, you know, this is the rule, no dogs within the white lined portions and that way we could still say in the, in the categories um, that dogs could be on leash on athletic fields, you know, between certain times or all the time, whatever we end up doing, but we could have just that one rule about the lined, inside the lined portions within the actual ordinance. Councilor Jordan? Well, just the way we designed the ordinance, it's, it puts all of that detail into the management plan. So like there's really nowhere, we'd be recreating a whole section of the ordinance to, to do that. We purposely, took those details and put them into the management plan so that we could adjust the management plan in a quicker fashion than an ordinance change. Didn't we put in the ordinance something about, um, like other municipal property? Or maybe we moved it's it again. In the management plan. Yeah, we did, okay. I understand the spirit of what you're trying to get to, Councilor Randall. I, I think that one of the nice features of the management plan is it rather succinctly and sort of in one place mm -hmm. sort of spells out, here are the places 
here's the permitted use, and so you're not having to sort of double back to, well, here's one thing that applies to everything that's in the ordinance, and then here's here's additional things that are part of the management plan. I, I think well, what I've come to see as sort of a good working model is what, what, what has been done with some of the other trails and other properties and things like that where um, rather than an ordinance language, it, it's sort of in more plain language, just tells people what they can do and where they can do it. Um, before we get too far down the path of uh, white lines and defining what an athletic field is and all that kind of stuff, um, my experience has been at various youth sports leagues, you know, Number one, if, if you go to the fields near the middle school, there's a whole bunch of lines on them because Saturday morning there's four soccer fields for six-year-olds that are lined up sideways, and then Saturday afternoon it's one big soccer field for 13-year-olds. And so what was a sideline in the morning is suddenly the middle of the playing pitch yep. in the afternoon. So I, I think it's going to be very difficult to get that granular okay. about what defines um, within or outside the white lines. Um, of course, the more vague you are with saying dogs should be contained to the non-athletic participation area, then, you know, yeah. that leaves a lot of open for interpretation as well. But anyway, I just, I just wanted to interject that because I think it's it's not realistic the way we use our fields to have such a rigid definition of what is or is not inside or outside the white lines. Okay. <clears throat> Other discussion? Councilor Straw. Uh, try to hit on a bunch of those yep. things. Uh, so with the definitions, I like the proposal about basically striking, uh, I made it, uh, the striking, uh, the detailed definitions and just pointing to the state statute. Um, the leash at 30 feet also seemed a, a little too long for me, so dropping it to 15, I'd feel comfortable about. If it stayed at 30, it's not the end of the world, but it does seem long. Uh, the last sentence of sight and voice control definition, um, Councillor Devereaux's point makes me look at that last sentence about if a dog approaches or remains within 10 feet of someone other than the responsible party, if the dog is not under voice control. It, the way it reads, it could just be if my dog approaches someone and they haven't consented, even though they're 50 feet away, suddenly the dog is deemed not under voice control. So that last sentence, I think, needs to be fixed. And I apologize for not seeing that previously. Um, and that was under section 712 definitions, subsection G. Uh, what else? Um, the dog tags, we're now requiring that the dog have a rabies tag on at all times. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, what that is attempting to express, although if they have the identification, I think that means that it can be looked up. Um, and this is probably me being really petty, but having my dog running around with multiple tags, it really jingles and makes a lot of noise. It's kind of annoying. Um, so either if it was a combo tag or something else, but I'd, I'd nix the adding the rabies tag. Part. I don't know how much it adds. I, maybe there's some thought as to why it's a good idea to have it there. Oh, I apologize. Uh, th so the new ordinance uh, it suggests that we should have both the license identification and a rabies tag on the dog. I don't know if it's required by state law. Maybe it is. It is. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. My my dog has it on. <laughs> now, that, now that I think of it, yes, it, it always has them on. It's really annoying. With you the have one of those new okay. those new silent ones. Yeah. Though, right? <laughs> it doesn't make a sound. Moving Moving on to the next item. <laughs> um, uh, oh, so uh, in making a decision uh, uh, on this motion in front of us, the 716, we still have that text under section 716 of, all, should we delete 716? So I, I'm assuming the motion is that we're keeping it. And I couldn't see any difference between 716 and the state law, so it seemed duplicative, not mm -hmm. the end of the world to keep it, but it, mm -hmm. as near as I can tell, I'm like, this is the exact same thing. Uh, but that would change all the numbering for the later provisions at this point, so I'd just keep it. Yeah. Um, then under the management section 717, um, this was goes to the point that uh, Councillor Caitlin Jordan was making with respect to um, uh, the categories and whatnot. Category two, we have the sentence there saying public roads, municipal sidewalks, and in or within 10 feet of municipal, municipal parking lot are designated category two. That's the only spot where we stuck something here rather than in the chart. So I would rip that sentence out and put it in the chart um, just because it does create contradictions with the chart because 
Elsewhere, the chart says anything not listed on this table is category three. And this isn't on the table, so which one, which one controls? Is it three or is it two? So I'd move that to the table. Um, and I think that just about wraps it up for my comments on this. Thank you, Councilor Dry. Any other discussion? So, Councilor Straw, do you want to make propose a friendly amendment to either remove or leave 716 and then, based on whichever you're suggesting, have a corresponding decision to remunerate or? So, I would not? say just if we're interpreting the motion as keeping 716, I'm fine with that. Just to avoid the hassle of renumbering. Let's keep 716. Okay. okay. Other discussion? So the last point you made on adding that provision to the table, or, yeah. or so are you ta saying take it out of the ordinance and put it into? I think it will dovetail with whatever we do with uh, the um, white lines on the field. If we're, uh, I think it should go over, but if we're making some motion involving athletic field changes and designations, it should be bundled with whatever that motion is, I would say. But it could stay. So you, like right yep. now you'd yep. have to make it a motion to yep. amend to take it out, but yep. we can have it here and there. Yep. Exactly, yep. good point. So then the only okay. other motion that would be needed is if you want to adjust the length of the leash. Somebody That's the last should thing I was coming to. Do that. Right. And then there's the question of sight and voice control. Um, how do we feel about that? What was your issue again relative to that? Uh, it says if a dog approaches or remains within 10 feet, does that mean if the dog approaches within 10 feet or remains within 10 feet? Is that how we want that? Mm -hmm. Interpreted? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if it bites a person, dog is not under voice control. So long as we're all saying that's how it's interpreted, is it? You can't, your dog cannot approach within 10 feet without getting permission first or remain within 10 feet without having permission. But then it begs the question of how's your dog even getting within 10 feet if you didn't already? All right. So. I apologize again. So it says, you pro and again, this is me probably being too pedantic going into the weeds on the ordinance. <laughs> that last sentence, I'm just like, hey, it's, it's muddled to me. Um, I, get the, I guess I get the gist of what it is after, but I, again, I'm not quite sure. Is, do we really need to have permission to have your dog off leash within 10 feet of someone if, you're, uh, if they're supposedly under voice control? 10 feet's pretty long, I guess. Yep. Councilor Randall. Yeah, I kind of, I agree now, thinking about some of the trails in town, like if you're in Robinson Woods and your dog is passing yeah. someone, I mean, it gets a little close. And I think the 10 foot rule may be a little too much. Okay. Thoughts? It, if it approaches and remains, could you change the or to and? Like if it approaches yep. and yep. continues, yep. Yep. that's fine. Yep. But if it approaches and remains yep. within 10 feet of somebody that doesn't want the dog there. That sounds that good to me. Clear it up? Yeah. Yep. I like, oh, go ahead. I take it as a friend. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. So I'd make a friendly amendment that we change the or in that sentence if it, to if a dog approaches and remains within 10 feet, as Second suggested by Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Okay. So you're making a friendly amendment? Yep. Then? I'll second it. And you're good with that? Okay. So we'll change or to and on line 39 of page one. Page one. Uh, do we want to address the leash length? Councilor I'll Devereaux? A, I'll make an amendment that we change the leash length to 15 feet or less in length. Could, uh, could the audience keep it down, please? We're trying to, it's, it's hard to hear what's being said with the commotion that's going on in the room. Thank you. Councilor To um, 15 feet or less in length. 
to 15 feet or less for leash length. Mm -hmm. Is there a second on that? Second. Councilor Randall, discussion? Um, I'm, I'm curious, in the other examples that were provided to us by the town planner, we had two that were 15 feet or less, one that was 30 feet or less, um, Um, my, I guess uh, my question is uh, not so much with the length, but I remember when we were discussing this previously that there was just concern, people had concern about material and yeah. things like that. Um, there's a little bit more with two of the examples that have been provided, a little bit more detail. Um, I, I'm just curious if, while we're addressing this leash question, if anybody has any thoughts on that, but so that we can hit both of them. Councilor Randall. I mean, it says, I think, used to restrain a dog, which I think is sufficient to, to have that in there. Councilor yeah, Jordan. If you choose to use an inefficient material, then you've violated the ordinance because it doesn't restrain yeah, the Yeah, I, I don't really have an opinion. I just, I just since, since we're talking about leashes, I just, I, I noticed there was a great deal more detail on the other one. So that's, that's the only point I'm making. I agree. I think that's, we know that it needs to be able to restrain the dog and be appropriate for the size and weight of the dog. Okay. So uh, motion to amend line 29 on page one to be 15 feet or less. Uh, Councilor Gabrielson, do you accept that friendly amendment? The length of the leash in the definition of leash from the current language says 30 feet or less in length and we're proposing to shorten that to 15 feet or less in length. Of order. Okay. I appreciate the clarification. Just as a point of order, we've had our public comment period. Okay. Um, the the council is now discussing and debating. I appreciate your interest and concern on it. Um, so. Um, I I would like to vote on that one. Okay. Uh, so the motion is uh, to amend um, the proposed. Uh, post standing motion uh, to take subsection E of 71 2, line 29 of page 1, to reduce from 30 feet or less to 15 feet or less uh, uh, the def in the definition of leash. All those in favor of the amendment? Opposed? That fails. Um, so the leash length will remain 30 feet uh, in the wording here. Um, was there anything else from the list of things that you went down, Chris? I just want to make sure we've covered your yep, points. We, we hit the leash. We dealt with the sight and ghost uh, voice control. Um, we're interpreting, we're keeping the 716 as listed. And then there was the category two uh, with the municipal sidewalks. But as Councillor Caitlin Jordan noted, we can just repeat it on the table to address the, mm -hmm. the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councillor Devereaux, were there some things from the points that you made that you want to address within the ordinance itself or hold that for the management plan? I think it. I think it's held for the management plan. Okay. Um, is there anything else outstanding from anybody that had concerns uh, about language in the ordinance? Okay. So at this point, the only change being made is. Let me go back to the point where it was changed. Is on voice and sight control changing or to and on line 39, correct? Correct. Okay, any further discussion? 
Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of approving the proposed amendments to Chapter 7 of the Dog Ordinance with the accepted friendly amendment uh, as just uh, noted. All those in favor? Opposed? That passes, six to one. Okay, so now we'll move on to the management plan. Um, is there discussion or a motion? Council Randall. Um, I'm not sure how to word this motion exactly, but I, I move that we approve the property management category designation with an amendment that all athletic fields shall be category two from April one to November one and category three from November two to March 31. And I believe Maureen did, I, I think this last athletic fields line is, is that for all athletic fields or? Uh, Fort Williams, uh, if I may, Mr. Chair, yep. at the multi-purpose field at Fort Williams has the uh, has that bifurcation in the uh, in the calendar. Right. The and others are, uh, I think, down at the bottom. If you see the athletic fields with the asterisk, mm -hmm. just above municipal property not listed above, those are all identified as category one. Okay, so I would move that 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 be amended to mirror the Fort Williams multi-purpose field, and also that under municipal property not listed above, we add the line from the ordinance about sidewalks and roads to bring that in. Okay, so your motion is to approve the management plan as presented with the amendments, changing athletic fields to be uh, the same designation as the Fort Williams multi-purpose field and adding the sidewalk language to municipal property not listed above. I yes. capture all that? Is there a second? I'll second. Is there discussion? Councilor Straw. Uh, uh, I understand we're going with it. The one problem is uh, athletic fields would include something such as Hannaford Turf Field, um, which I think so. I, I see where you're going, but I think it's too broad. Um, so that's why I was not willing to second. Well, I have to agree. And then there's other sports that are played during the winter or the fields might not have snow at certain times and the kids are out there um, running, doing different things on the fields. And I just don't see it as appropriate to have the dogs on the fields during that time. Other discussion? Council uh, Randall. So I, I guess the first point I would make is that I, I'm somewhat in agreement with the voices we've heard about the lack of dangers of dog feces, although recognizing that there is bacteria there, I'm very much pro exposure to bacteria and strengthening the immune system. Um, and I think when we get, when we regulate too much, we can tip too far in the other direction. So. Although I think it is probably best to keep the dogs off of the fields or on leash on the fields in the in the season, you know, in the spring and in the summer and in the fall. In the winter, if they're on the fields, you know, we do have in the ordinance rules about cleaning up after your dog. We can do some more education about cleaning up after your dogs, but. Um, I, I just see that people aren't going to follow that rule. I mean, I, it seems to me like people aren't going to follow it if we go that far, and I'd rather make a rule that is reasonable and people will follow. And I think that you know, what's, what's happened at the Fort Williams multipurpose field is a pretty reasonable rule. People have, from, from what I've heard at least, been respectful of it. Um, and I imagine if we did that with all the athletic fields, we'd see the same thing. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, thank you, Councillor Garvin. Um, however, if you look at Portland, Falmouth, South Portland, none of these towns or cities allow dogs on any of their athletic fields at any time, at any time during the year. 
Um, and those are just three towns that are close to us. And if you Google it and look at other cities across the United States and in Maine, dogs aren't allowed on athletic fields um, for various reasons. And I think that um, we have a lot of people that are very responsible about cleaning up after their dogs. And there's a few people that aren't that tend to ruin it for everybody. Um, but really the issue is um, health and safety of our residents. And by allowing dogs on athletic fields, there's really no reason when we have so many acres of available land, over a thousand acres. And I agree we need places where um, during the winter people can walk and it's more accessible for people with dogs. But our athletic fields are just such a small portion of our fields in town that um, I think we need to be fair to all of our residents and think about um, our children and the use of the athletic fields. Councilor Jordan. Um, I'm gonna go back to, and it's echoing a bit of what um, Councilor Devereaux has mentioned. I think we gotta go and start looking at what's the problem we're trying to solve. We have uh, uh, spaces in town that are designated for purposes. And so if what we're trying to do, uh, because we're talking about athletic fields, that's designated for a purpose. If the problem we're trying to solve is uh, ensuring that the uh, dog owners in the town have access to uh, uh, adequate open space and accessible open space and space that is uh, has available parking and um, etc then why don't we designate additional space for that purpose uh, because I think that's what we're talking about is how do I have the space in order to uh, be able to exercise my dog, have the social interaction with friends, et cetera. And so I think we gotta look at what is it we're trying to solve. And uh, athletic fields are designated for athletic functions. I don't care whether there's snow on it or not. That is, that is an athletic field. Um, I mean, can I drive my snowmobile over the athletic fields in the winter time? In the past we couldn't. Uh, I don't know if you can today. So I think those are the types of questions that we need to answer. Other comments? I think one other thing that I'd like to see clarified here too is just this lists athletic fields under the marsh area heading oh, yeah. and under the ordinance that we, if, if so if what we're really talking about is the athletic fields at Gullcrest, um, I, I guess two thoughts here. First, I would in practice and like to have this management plan adopted in a, in a way that most is most consistent with the practice that's already in place. Um, and so I, that seems like we've had a lot of input from members of the public um, and I'm not eager to dramatically change the practice of dogs on or off athletic fields. So that's just sort of my general outlook on where I'm at with this particular question right now. But um, in terms of which athletic fields this applies to, according to the ordinance we just adopted, if they're the ones up at the school, the school board has the authority to make that designation, not, not right, this group. Exactly. Um, so if this, is, if this is the athletic fields at Gullcrest, we should just specify that. Or, or, or specify that it's something else. Councilor Straw? Uh, uh, that's a great point. Uh, the fact that it is under the marsh area heading, it could be interpreted that's talking only about the marsh area athletic fields, which leaves the question of what about the other athletic fields in town that aren't on school property. Um, and just kind of going with that, we need to fix 
the heading aspect of things, there are two separate Stonegate area uh, sections on different pages. Yeah, I think so, we had noted that last time and it just didn't get yeah, picked yep. up in this version, so. And, and I'd, uh, I, I'd put Fort Williams under the um, northeast area instead of the Stonegate area. But, I, I think I think what we were looking to do was just have Fort Williams be Fort Williams. Under its own heading. Yeah. Yep, yep. Most clear that way. Yep. Um, I'm in agreement on the point about, I, I was going to make it, and, and you guys beat me to it, about um, just listing out what and what the athletic fields are. So, um, again, um, excluding the ones on the school campus, uh, you've got the fields at Gullcrest, you've got um, Lions, Lions Field, Lions. Playstead, et cetera. Um, so I think we just need to list them out here for clarity uh, rather than just broadly say athletic fields, particularly in an area that's ill-defined as marsh area anyway. Well, and on this table, Lions Field is listed as category three. Yeah. Um, I think it probably makes more sense to group all of, I understand that the list is bucketed by geography. I think it probably makes sense in that case to take all of the, um, all of the fields that are athletic fields and, and group them in a single subhead. Yep. If I may ask a question, yep. Lions Field has a significant amount of additional open space beyond the baseball fields. Mm -hmm. I'm I just wondering yep. for the members of the ordinance committee, was that part of the definition there? You're thinking about the larger parcel in general and then athletic fields being the ball fields that are there. Just trying to look at that, I guess, refinement uh, or designation between the two. Right. Yes. Okay. What was the answer? Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> the Lions Field you're, you're talking about the playing fields. fields. And then there's Lion Field Field Park, if yeah. you will. Yeah. So, but you're. There's two separate right. categories, basically. Is that noted here then? Or? No, it's not. Okay. But at Lions Field, don't they also play girls um, field hockey there? At Lions Field? Not that I'm aware of. No. There's no hockey or anything over there? Okay. There's two Just little league fields and then a bunch of green space adjacent. Yeah. yeah. Other discussion? Councilor Randall. So should we just break out in each section, for example, under interior area, we'll have Lions Field and then another line that says Lions Field, athletic, athletic fields, Gullcrest, mm -hmm. Gullcrest athletic fields. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Councillor Gabrielson had said, had said that maybe we should uh, designate them consistent with the way in which they are currently used. <laughs> um, Gullcrest is regularly used by people for dogs off leash all the time, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think is appropriate. Um, I, I don't know what other council members think about certain, you know, is it is it a hard and fast rule that every athletic field is going to be no dogs ever? Are there some athletic fields where we would be okay with having dogs off leash in the winter or dogs on leash other times of year? Goldcrest is one that strikes me as particularly problematic because of the nature of the, the property there, um, particularly in the winter time where it's very difficult to tell what the athletic field is. So you've got a whole bunch of trail area there. You've got a whole bunch of open space that is um, off leash voice control allowed. And then you've got a vast amount of athletic playing field that's, you know, if it's under snow cover is almost impossible to delineate. Well, where's the actual field mm -hmm. in that? And so to me, that one strikes me as a particularly challenging one. Um, especially because a, a lot of people do go there, um, you know, for the express purpose of the, the openness. I mean, it, it's one of the more open spaces. Um, you know, Fort Williams is a little different. I mean, people know what that field is and where it exists and things like that. Obviously, Lions Field, Playstead, those are fenced in ball fields. It's much easier to tell where those fields is. Gullcrest is one that I think is particularly challenging under, under these, whether, whether we say it's, uh, regardless of what decision we make on on how it's to be used, I think it's very diffi difficult for the user to then ascertain, well, where is the field? <laughs> so mm -hmm. anyway, that's just my point on that one. 
Chris. And so to answer both of those uh, points or to address both those points. So with, uh, I think of when my kids are playing Little League uh, at Playstead and they're behind the, uh, the backstop, people are always sitting there with their dogs and lawn chairs behind the backstop. So is that on the is that on the athletic field or is that the area behind it? So I'd like, I don't want to be banning people from having their dogs behind the backstop if they're cleaning up after them. But at the same time, like the multi-purpose field or a soccer field where, as Councillor Garvin noted, the lines shift depending on who's playing and whatnot, then it makes sense, Do I, should the dogs be up observing on the side? I did it all the time with my kids, but perhaps people would have to be on the very perimeter edge of the overall green area. So. I, I want to take all that into account. I don't have a solution on how to do it, but if we're trying to respect what people are currently doing uh, that isn't causing uh, dog feces, on, in, separate from the disease aspect, it's just really, really annoying when your kid's playing soccer and the next thing you know, you gotta be cleaning the cleats off. In um, that aspect, I totally understand why we shouldn't have the dogs pooping or having the opportunity to poop on the, the athletic field itself. But at the same time, if people take their dog to watch a game, they're often sitting in the shade on the edges and somehow it would be great if we could continue to allow that by however we craft this language. I think language that would be something to the effect of dogs are not allowed on the playing surfaces at athletic facilities, um, but allowed, you know, in, in uh, um, spectator areas or something like that, I think accomplishes that. I, I'm not sure exactly how to word that, but I think that's generally the spirit of what I'm hearing here. I, I, I would also submit that the language that um, was proposed already about having them on leash during the season, off leash after the season, allows for the type of, of use that Chris was talking about. And in practice, if there's a game going on, whoever is calling that game is going to not, you know, the referee, you're not going to have what loose dogs on a field that's actively being refereed. Well, sometimes it's just practices, there aren't referees. I, I, I don't think it's fair to put that on them, but um, anyway, and I speak as an umpire, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Well, there are children that are afraid of dogs, too, or might be allergic, and you've got loose dogs running around and they're trying to play a game. That's not very um, responsible for those children, either. I don't think, I don't think it, right now the question is whether they're on leash or off leash. We're talking they'd be on leash at a game, correct? Yep. I mean, like, yep. that's mm -hmm. so. so there's yeah. no chance hopefully that there's loose dogs running around on any athletic field during any kind of game, whether you're afraid or allergic. So I think you a little misconnect on that. There's, we're not discussing letting them come and hang out without a leash. Well, he was just talking about them running and the referees having to take care of it. I, I also think that the flexibility of the tool that is in the ordinance we just adopted is such that if we go, if we apply that general rule that seems to be working at the multi-purpose field in Fort Williams now as part of this ordinance and it becomes an issue anywhere, it's, we, we can deal with that. <laughs> um, if there are particular fields where it becomes an issue, we can amend this management. Jordan. Well, you comment as saying that it's working. There's several people who comment that it's not working. I mean, I have a 10-year-old nephew who practices down on that multi-purpose field, and the coaches are constantly having to put cones out where there is current feces before every practice because it's there. And and the same thing at the school fields when they had to play, and they played there over the summer. They're having to do it. So, I'm not saying it's you guys, but someone is letting their dog, you know, use the fields and not pick up after them. And that's the reality of, of the unfortunate part is there is probably thousands of dog owners in the town that are doing the right thing, and there's 10 of them who aren't. And it's those 10 that's going to ruin it for everyone in order for us to protect everyone. That's the, the hard part. Right, and so, you know, just the other day at the fort, I had a, a woman's dog run up to me in the parking lot 
and I told her this isn't the off leash area. And she's like, oh, well, I'm just, I'm so close. I'm like, but it's <laughs> you. You are the reason that we're having this discussion. You're the one breaking the rules. And I told her, I'm a town councillor, and I'm going to be discussing this next week. And it's you that is causing the problems. And she wasn't very happy with me. <laughs> but that's the reality, and I'm sorry, but it's those 10 people, you find them, and we can... But that's what we're dealing with, and I'm sorry to all the other dog lovers and owners who are doing their jobs, but we're not picking on you. We're just trying to protect everyone from the 10. Councilor, uh, a quick point uh, just to make sure we touch on this is there also has been raised the argument that they should never be allowed on athletic fields because even when they're on their off season, they're still damaging the surface. We spend a significant amount of uh, money maintaining those surfaces. And I know my dog, maybe she's less coordinated than others, but if I throw the ball, she can never get it. She always goes past, she skids out, it tears up the, the ground, you know, like, ah, that stinks. Um, but then someone has to come by and reseed and fill in the holes. And yes, the kids do it just as much as the dogs. Uh, but at least the argument has at least been put forth that we should think about whether we say, oh, well, kids do it too, or, you know, dogs do it more. Nevertheless, the dogs are, do cause some amount of damage on the surface. All right, the current motion on the table is to adopt the property management plan with a few modifications. Um, number one being um, the inclusion of sidewalks as language in the municipal property not listed above. Number two is the designation of athletic fields as category two and three to mirror the Fort Williams multipurpose field and some regrouping of um, uh, the designated areas to uh, group athletic fields together, uh, change the subheading to Fort Williams uh, for, uh, for the Fort Williams areas, and uh, be more clear in the um, areas that have both playing field and adjacent park areas, um, which we're talking about there. Is there further discussion, or are we ready to vote on that, or? Do you want to change your original motion in any way, or? I just don't know if it's clear enough to vote on. It feels a little messy. Okay. Are we going to vote on each one separately or all together? Um, I mean, it would be to vote on all of it together, I think. All right, I just want to be clear on the change. The motion the that was made was the, what, what Valerie put forth of this is the plan, but changing these designations for fields. Right. And then the other stuff is, I think, more housekeeping around how we order the list and things like that. But um, I just want to be clear, she had talked about changing um, the athletic fields to um, dogs off leash during the winter. Is that correct? Is that part of what we're voting? Yeah. yeah. To be mirror Fort Williams. Right. You know. Multi-purpose fields I, I, at this point in time, correct? Right. So, so all the athletic fields would be um, dogs allowed during winter. The non-school ones. Right. Yeah, with the point which dealt with my point about Hannaford is that we right. don't cover the schools, so it wouldn't affect Hannaford. So my prior argument is new. Right. Well, yeah. It would only affect the town-controlled field, town being municipal fields, it wouldn't affect the school's fields because those are covered by the school's de definitions. So Hannaford wouldn't fall under this, so I made the argument about Hannaford Field earlier. It was irrelevant. But it would cover lines. Okay. Are there other points of discussion or not? So we have one, two, three, four fields that we're talking about. I just want to make sure that we're all talking. <coughs> Fort Williams, Gullcrest, Playstead, Lyons. Is that what we'd be discussing? Are there any other fields? No, that's, that's it. <coughs> I think that's that's pretty comprehensive <coughs> as far as For athletic, athletic, fields. As athletic fields. Council Jordan. I just have a couple housekeeping questions. One. Would we have the power right now to change the school athletic fields because we're voting on it? Two, has anybody reached out to them recently to ask them their opinions on if they would change 
once we pass this to mirror what we do with the rest of the town's athletic fields. Uh, Matt's indicating that Maureen might be able to answer that for us. I didn't even know Maureen was here. She's hiding back there. Mm -hmm. Secret weapon. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I didn't want you to have to sit there for no reason. If I was really hiding, you wouldn't find me. <laughs> um, so, the, the first of all, I mean, you're the council. You can adopt anything you want for the school athletic fields. You can decide that the school athletic fields aren't going to be managed by the schools, they're going to be managed by you. So that's way open to you. Secondly, I spent a lot of time talking to the school superintendent to get to what's on this chart right now. And I know she spent time talking to the athletic director and I didn't get any sense that there was any interest from them to do anything different. It was hard to get to where they are. Well, that's, that's basically exactly what you told us during ordinance. So I was just yep. more curious if, like in the last two weeks, with all of the, our new discussion, if they had changed or talked to them. Not a syllable. Somebody not specifically a said, if we ban dogs, do you want to ban dogs too? Was that asked, I guess? No, I did not ask that. Councilor Randall. Um, I would be more comfortable leaving the school campus in the hands of the superintendent. Um, and that way, you know, if there are Thank concerns. You, Sorry. Okay. If there are concerns um, from the community and they wish to address the superintendent and ask that that be changed, then the ordinance accommodates that and they can do that through that process. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking back my take back. Um, when I look at this table, actually, under the Gullcrest area, school campus is listed, and it says during school day and from a half hour before and after uh, various events, it's a category two. And then outside the school day and more than half hour before and after certain stuff, it becomes a three. Mm -hmm. So arguably, Hannaford Field does become off-leash during those time periods under what we're... I think at. they're going to want to look at this tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so. are, you're saying they should, or they are going to? I think they're. I think they're going to. Oh, okay, I think great. somebody's going to call them tomorrow. Not me, but okay. I'm just saying somebody yeah. else is going to pick up on that yeah. and going to be making a phone call. Yeah. All right. Somebody who. Well, we could add. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we could add a, a line that says Hannaford Field. No dogs. <laughs> But as is, that would deal with Hannaford Field, but what about all the other uh, athletic fields? Where I think right now dogs are not allowed at all. I could have that wrong. Uh, so we're changing it so dogs would be permitted off leash on all the school athletic fields, except for any ones we iterate or otherwise, unless we had something saying no school athletic fields as well. But presumably that was addressed when the superintendent looked at it and talked to the athletic director. Yeah. But they'll have to pass something, and until that happens this would stand. Right. So regarding Hannaford Field, um, again, it was, it was really difficult to get the school department to come to a conclusion that kind of struggled as you're struggling now. And one of their main issues, and I understand you're trying to get at this issue of how is it being used now, and the response I got was, they put up signs now that say no dogs and people ignore them. And there is a huge amount of discomfort, it appears, on the part of school staff to confront people and tell them your dog is not supposed to be here. So um, I think the Conservation Committee understood that once there is a decision, there is going to need to be an effort to educate people, to put up better signage. The, the dog walking group of the town has been adamant about educating people and we have and they have been huge supporters of this ordinance and we've said look we need to know what the decision is first and then we are going to have to do an education effort and a signage effort and whatever you decide on these athletic fields you know there's going to have to be an effort to put some signage up and maybe more things than that um, so what's happening now I my sense the conversations I've had is what's happening now is inconsistent with what the ordinance currently says. 
So the ordinance is saying in a lot of places, no dogs on athletic fields, and in fact, they are all over the place. Anybody have any further comments? Um, my opinion is that um, we, uh, for purposes of clarity, safety, uh, and other things, we should not have dogs on any playing surfaces of athletic fields um, at any time of the year. Um, I think that uh, even in the winter time, we're seeing you know uh, changes to snow cover and things like that. The fields are impacted, um, whether it's winter or not. And um, I have no problem with people having a dog at a game on the sideline watching, uh, things like that. But um, I think we should keep the dogs off any of the playing surfaces. And I think that it's the cleanest, and I, I, don't, I don't mean by the pun cleanest, but the simplest way to communicate to people that here are the places that you can have dogs, leash, on leash, not, whatever. Um, but athletic playing field surfaces are not a place um, for that. So that's my opinion. So Councilor Jordan? Before you call the question, yep. would it be easier to make an amendment to, so we don't lose all the other stuff in that motion <clears throat> to amend the bifurcated dates from the original motion and have it go back to just dogs, how would we do that? Or just vote it down, which is... I think we just vote. vote. Okay, yeah, and then never mind, and then start, there's start really over. There's thing other yep. than the... Well, it's just all the other things he listed, we'll just have to redo, just fine. Go for it. So all those in favor of Councilor Randall's motion, uh, which was to adopt the management plan and have athletic fields be consistent with the current Fort Williams um, split season plan. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Let's have another motion. So I was trying to do before, but it's very hard. So... list all that out. So we need to, a motion to include the sidewalks and streets from the language of the ordinance, have a category for that. A motion, in that motion we're also going to list out Lions Field, Lions Field Athletic Fields, have a heading of athletic fields so it's more clear. Golf Crest and Golf Crest Athletic Fields, what else do we need? Could, could we take them one by one? Could we amend the draft table and then adopt the whole thing once we've made multiple amendments? Hmm. Say that again? Yes. So we have a, we have a proposed draft. Yeah. Rather, than, rather than listing six amendments, can we, just, can we come up with those five or six and vote on each amendment That's and then adopt the whole amended kit and caboodle? So I, I move that we adopt the table as presented in our package. Okay. I second that. Uh, all right, great. So now we have that sitting there now. Discussion. Some amendments. Yep. No. I move, um, I would propose that we amend the table um, so that um, sidewalks and roads are listed under municipal property, not listed above as category two. Second. Let's vote on it. All those in favor of that amendment to the motion? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Go for another one. I move. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> gosh, I don't know what the if next you, one is. <laughs> if you just go down the list yeah. and, and amend as we go, like so. So the next one would be if we start from the top, um, changing the subheading of Stonegate area to yeah. grouping all of the of the Fort Williams ones together as Fort Williams Park. Mm -hmm. Second that. <laughs> All those in favor? It's unanimous. So then I would amend Fort Williams multi-purpose field, right, to be... Category... Uh, category one. Two all year, but 
no dogs on the playing surface. Is that what we're shooting for? Language like that? Yes. yes. So it's like category two, but category one on playing field, playing surface. On playing surface. Or we could put a second, another line that says Fort Williams multi-purpose field playing surface, category one. Sure. Just to be consistent with the rest of how it's broken down yeah. line by line. Yeah. Well, then, I mean, remainder of park covers everything else. Right? Correct. Right. Which would be two. Yeah, so just right. change multi purpose field to playing surface as a one, and then the remainder of park is a two. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, no. Uh, yeah. Right. Absent the first item. Right. Because yeah, up, up above you have the off leash, it right. is all delineated, and so right. that's not right. changing that. It's right. Just so you're not changing that. So you're just changing the multi purpose field playing surface to a one. I just add playing surface to it. Right. And then the remainder of the park would include the rest of the right. multi purpose field, which would be a two. That's good. Yep. So you're making a motion to amend. To, to read multi-purpose field so playing, playing surface, surface and then have that be a one. one. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Discussion. Oh, okay. Discussion, sorry. Uh, so I just want to uh, point out, so one of the problems from my perspective for the dog owners is that there's been this slow erosion of the space and it seemed like this April 1st, November 1st, November 2nd, March 31st was part of a compromise that was previously struck. Um, it also, it, I thought that there was also then it was going to be uh, fenced off during the playing season that it seems to have inconsistently occurred as well. Um, so if we do go this route, um, maybe we will, maybe we won't. If we do go this route, I would love to give them some type of um, assurance in some way that like we're not going to keep eroding and eroding and eroding until finally there are no dogs exactly. off leash. And f I don't know how we accomplish that. I don't know if we like because I assume if we built a giant um, enclosure for dogs as a giant massive dog run, then everyone wouldn't be happy with that because they'd feel we're sticking off leash in there. Uh, point being that I'd love to give them some type of assurance that this erosion isn't going to continue till you're totally kicked out of the park. So, and that's, I now know how to do that. So what you're saying then is that what we need to uh, seriously consider and um, and let the dog owners know is that we feel that we need to seek other places where there can be open space and off leash for dogs and it needs to be accessible. Yes, although I think nothing will um Nothing will replace losing Fort Williams, just given I, that. But aren't there other, Fort Williams is a large park. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. are oh, other yeah. sections yeah. away from the athletic fields that could be designated as run areas. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Yep, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So. There's 97 acres now that are run, um, that are category three mm -hmm. in Fort Williams. So all year round. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I intend to vote against the amendment because I, I do feel that it, it reflects that compromise and agreement that's already in place. And I'm also, I'm cognizant of the fact that um, there are a limited number of spaces in town that are as, as accessible, particularly in the winter months as this one. And also that we are looking at developing a renewed master plan for the fort. And I would imagine that that may involve some consideration of changes to the dog areas. And I'd much rather have that conversation in the context of the larger master plan for Fort Williams than in the context of saying, here's the traditional off-leash dog area and we're just gonna take this chunk out before we even open up that larger discussion. Because that was a great point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, my, my point was, I, I, I think the agreement that's in place now reflects a compromise position and that we're gonna be looking at 
the master plan for Fort Williams Park and rather than making the decision now to just take one more piece of the off-leash area and pull it out without having thought through what the rest of how that impacts the rest of the master plan for the park I'd much rather have that conversation in the context of the larger master plan discussions for the fort so I, I just want uh, that's a great point specifically the, the master plan part uh, I you, you actually swayed which way I was going to vote with that point. <laughs> uh, so I, I am going to end up saying let's keep the status quo, uh, although I am incredibly cognizant of the pro fact that there are problems with the status quo. And I am also cognizant of the fact that it is going to create an appearance like we're kicking the can down the road. But uh, as Penny noted, as you noted, that Fort Williams master plan, one of the directions they need to be given is come up with a good permanent solution to deal with this because us trying to brainstorm it right here tonight, I don't think is gonna necessarily, and that's the problem is that we are in effect kicking the can down the road. Um, but at the same time, fencing the kids in uh, isn't the solution if we fence around the multi-purpose field. Uh, if we don't have a fence, the dogs don't know where the edge is of where they can run, and as much as everyone wants it to be voice control, <laughs> the voice control doesn't work and the dogs are gonna be up there, so, it's a, so we either need to fence the kids in, we need to fence the dogs in, or we need to somehow geographically separate the two, and it seems like that, unfortunately, although it's years away, totally hear that this sucks, it seems like that's something the master plan would encompass, which was a great point, and you swayed me for that reason, unfortunately. Other comments? Mr. Chairman, just yep. thinking about the Ford and Mr. Rio's question, uh, you have the baseball field as well at Fort Williams. And I don't know if the council was thinking about having that as an amended identified section as well, or if you were thinking about the uh, athletic. <clears throat> I'm asking about the baseball field at Fort Williams Park as well, if that's included in this part of the discussion, or if that's going to be a second surface. amendment as a playing surface at, at Fort Williams. So. The softball field. Yeah, thanks. For, thank you, Roger. So, just wanted the council to to think about that. If you wanted to have that as part of this segment of your conversation, or if you wanted to have it as a separate element uh, to to um, uh, provide as an amendment. So, sorry. I think it <laughs> doesn't. It need. Um, shouldn't we deal with it separately? The the baseball field. Because we got oh, the, I think so. yeah. Because it, it keep, it's going to keep it pure if we just uh, take. Yeah, I would just add them. a line item here that says Fort right. Williams dash cool. baseball and softball fields. Good, thanks. So the current amendment is we're still focused on the Fort Williams multipurpose field playing surface, changing that to a category one. Is what's on the table. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? That passes. Uh, is there, does anybody want to add um, an item for Fort Williams uh, baseball and softball field? Uh, I move that we add a line item for Fort Williams baseball and softball fields as a category one. Is there a second? Second. second. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that passes. Fort Williams Park, remainder of park. Uh, no need to change that then. Oh. <laughs> I, want, I just realized what I just did. Um, with the, uh, it, it should have been the baseball fields. Yes, yeah, sorry. Field playing, surfaces. Playing that, surfaces. Surf, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah sorry. Good point of we knew it. You, we, yes. you knew what I meant. Okay. The, the intent. intent was this. Yes. We got Great, it. thank you. That was the surface. Thank you, though, for. Clarification purposes. Um, no changes needed to Fort Williams remainder of park, correct? No. Um, the next was area in discussion was school campus, if I remember. Actually, Playstead, no, Playstead park, park is next. Oh, did I go past that? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, so do we, do we want to retain Stonegate area as the header for Stonegate Trails, Robinson's Woods, Lovett Woods, Playstead Park, or should Playstead Park be grouped with Fort Williams Park since it's just adjacent? Yeah. I would vote for the latter. Yeah. Okay. 
So Playstead Park gets bucketed with the Fort Williams Park area. And uh, so Playstead Park playing surface is what I'm looking for. And potentially changing that to a one. I move that we change the Plastid Park uh, playing surface, whoa, that's a lot of P's, uh, to a one. Is there a second? Second. Discussion, yep. So are we leaving Playstead Park and adding Playstead Park playing surface? Mm -hmm. So there will be two. So Playstead Park will oh. be? Yeah, I, I think we would do similar Playstead Park remainder of park like we did for Fort Williams. So currently we're talking about Playstead Park playing surface category one. Any discussion? I, I just know in principle I actually don't think that the dogs should be on the playing surfaces. I, my, my proposal with Fort Williams was really one of what was this the right time to make the distinctions Understood. for the rest of them. Um, <laughs> I support keeping the dogs off the playing surfaces. Any other discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. So we will have um, Playstead Park, remainder of park, also stay on the list, and that would be a category three. Right. Correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. So your next one would be Lions Field playing surfaces, mm -hmm. category one? Yep. I second that. <laughs> Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? So remainder of park remains a number three? Yep. Now we're over to the Gullcrest school campus area that Chris had brought up before. And so how will it play out if we put something in the school board can overrule it with the way our ordinance is written? They can, ch they have the power to change. They can change it and it will, o so it will in effect overrule what we've passed or do they lack the ability if we put something in here to override it? The way our ordinance is written. The way the, I believe the way the ordinance is written, we can change it, but they have the management authority. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. We, yeah, we control it, but they can do it. They can make it. If they want to. They can change it if they want to. Got it. So I would move that we add a category for Hannaford Field and that we designate Hannaford Field a one. Second. So can I just ask a question? Because there's been a lot, of, I'm fine with that, but I'm just curious. When we talk, when, when it keeps coming up about the school athletic fields, I only hear people referring to Hannaford Field, and there's a whole oh, mess of other fields there. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to talk about the other. Okay. Fields. I just want to make sure that people aren't using Hannaford Field as a proxy for all of the school athletic fields. Okay. And it was intentional. People, okay. I just want to be clear about that. So, could you repeat? You made a motion to add Hannaford Field and have it be designated Category One. Yes. Correct, and, and Councilor Strauss, I'm getting that. Yep. And managed by the school superintendent. Yep. Okay. It, it, just to make the note that Hannaford Field's artificial turf, you're not even supposed to have food on it. I'm, it's news to me that people are having dogs out there, but that one seems like a clear one. Any other discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? So, Do you have a follow-up on school, school athletic fields? Yeah, well, while we're on school, I want to change the categories from school campus athletic fields to a one, and school campus remainder can be a two with their uh, outside of school day more than half hour, half, you know, before and after school and events. So school or, campus athletic playing surfaces, a one. Right. Remainder of school. The rest of their stuff. Open space uh, is pursuant to these the parameters. Their half hour and half hour things, yeah. That's your motion? Yes. Is there a second? I'll second. Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? And it was specifically athletic surfaces? That's right, so I'm mm -hmm. just adding the athletic. Athletic playing surfaces. Okay. School campus athletic services are one. The rest of their K 
campus will be a, the two and their, th their three for their Based different the timetables. Time Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? One opposed, Valerie? Uh, okay. It, and uh, field services. the school board can always make changes to that designation we made if they so choose going forward. Exactly. So we're basically putting in a default until they act. So the last is um, the Goldcrest Athletic Fields, um, which we have. We have Goldcrest area as one <coughs> subsection. And then at the very bottom where we have marsh area is where it previously said athletic fields. Mm -hmm. We basically have Goldcrest area twice. Mm -hmm. yeah, we do. Um, so we, we should consolidate the two Goldcrest areas. <coughs> Or we strike that last line that says athletic fields. Right. We've already dealt with that all anymore because we've dealt right. with all of the athletic right. fields elsewhere in the table. Okay, so we need to add in one of the Goldcrest areas. We need to add Goldcrest playing field surfaces. Does anybody want to propose that? We need a motion. On yes. That? So moved, sir. So move to add Goldcrest playing field surfaces, or athletic playing surfaces as a category one. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, is there a discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That passes. And then add the sidewalk language to the municipal property, not sidewalk and street language to the municipal property not listed above. Yeah, I think we already did that. That's, that's, that's already done. Okay. okay. But we still have that athletics line at the very bottom. So I, I move we strike the athletics field line at the second from the bottom in light of the fact that it's now encompassed by the prior amendments. Is that right? Okay. Any discussion on that? Councilor Randall, what's the second on that? Um, all those in favor? Okay, so. One more. Part of one of your motions was it to consolidate the multiples, like you have two Stonegate areas, two Marsh areas, two Gulf Crest areas. Can we make a motion to consolidate those headings? Oh. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Please. Um, I think the cover memo that I submitted to you explain why they're headings in two places. This, this whole list mirrors your open space management plan and the conservation committee back when divided the plan into major areas and minor areas. So it's divided by region and then major and minor. Certainly you can consolidate everything, but if you leave the same framework that's in the management plan, it's gonna be a lot easier for the police department to use the management plan as a reference. The management plan has a map of every open space in it. So the idea is if you keep that framework, it might be easier for them to locate spaces. But obviously, if you want to consolidate them, you can. Could we just rename like major and minor or one and two so that there's, they're not the exact same heading? Again, you can do what you want, but in the open space management plan, there is a table that lists all of these properties exactly the same way you see them, and it has page numbers that include pictures of each property. So. It's, it's your call. Um, thank How you for you clarifying information. I think it's, um, hey, Maureen, actually, real quick question. The, was the Stonegate area, though, because we had talked previously at the August meeting about changing that to be Fort Williams area, right, or Fort yes. Williams Park area, so yes. that that just not, that it get picked up, or? I heard you, and I've made a note. Yes. It's, it's going to be a deviation from the structure of the I think it's plan. much better for clarity for the, the public and the users, though. It's definitely your opinion. call. So, mm -hmm. 
Castro. Yeah, so that was going to be my major point. Um, and perhaps we encompass this, we accomplish this by having a color coded map, but I'm uh, most concerned about making sure that this is accessible and understandable to the general public uh, as opposed to its use uh, in the enforcement aspect because our, 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 our staff will figure it out and they'll know where it is, but the general public is going to look at this and they'll look and say, oh, Stonegate area up here, and they're not going to think, oh, i got to look down here as well. So we, right. either we have a color-coded map of some sort to help them, or otherwise I'd rather have it consolidated into single headings for the various areas. I agree. I think we can, I think we can translate this into public-facing materials right. differently than, you know, right. and, and, and Fizi, I, I do think, particularly for the reasons we've discussed tonight, that having those Fort Williams things called out, though, is important for that clarity. So, um, and then we can take this and, as you say, turn that into some sort of more user-friendly, you know, grid or document or whatever. So, so that all being said, um, with all those amendments having been approved or not, uh, I think they all were, but. Um, is there any further discussion on the original motion to adopt the plan now with all the amendments that have been made and, and passed? Just, just a point, there are the other athletic facilities, tennis courts, basketball courts, they're off limits now, but they're not mentioned here. Thank you. Councilor So if I think of the various athletic facility, uh, so tennis courts in, um, what not uh, at Fort Williams as this is, you'd be allowed to have your dog on leash on a tennis court the way we just did this. Um, so we got to think about, do we want you to fix that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so there's the tennis courts. We still didn't deal with the, what about the children's garden area? Um, then um, the, how would the athletic fields would have been the playing, we would have covered the tennis courts at the school by virtue of that playing surface mm -hmm. comment, presumably. Right. In, in, I think that's... I think Why that, couldn't we have something that's any sport playing surface or any athletic playing surface? Although, yeah, perhaps, um, yeah. Maybe that's too... Can I ask a dumb question? As a matter of practice, are people running their dogs on the tennis courts and basketball yeah. courts? Yes. Are they really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Matt. If, if, it, if it would please the council, uh, let me look into that part. I mean, it may be a question of of enforcement and just making sure people play by the rules because up until this point, it hasn't been part of our ordinance, but. It's something that I think we can address from, from a management side of that. And maybe a question of putting signage back up when people. Except if it's not listed yeah. here, then people. Right, it's the there. remainder. We list the remainder of the part. Right. It's I, in the remainder I, of the so I, I, I move that we uh, add an additional line amendment. Um, any additional playing surfaces not listed above, uh, listed as category one. Any additional municipal playing surf, uh, ath athletic. any additional municipal athletic playing surface is not listed above category one. Is there a second? A second. Discussion, Councilor Randall. Um, if it's not a problem, and we can just post at tennis courts and basketball courts, yeah, you know, no dogs. That, I mean. Do we do we actually want no dogs? Don't some people maybe bring their dog and kind of like tie it up while they're playing tennis? And is it a problem? Are we are we addressing something that's not actually an issue? I mean, Fort Williams Park is seems to be one thing where there are a lot of issues, but um, so if you sure. tied it to the, a tree or the fence outside the playing surface, you'd be okay. In what if situation. it's on a bench, like inside the tennis, like inside the fence in the tennis court? Or what if it's tied to the fence, like it inside the basketball court? The workshop discussion. The remainder of the park is two. So even if you bring your dog into the tennis court or the children's garden, you have to be on leash. Right. Do we? I just think we don't have the same concern as with like a large, open, grassy field where someone might let their dog run free and go to the bathroom, whereas on a paved surface, like a tennis court 
surface or like a basketball court surface, it doesn't have, it doesn't bring up the same issues and maybe those are fine to just be covered by the category two dog on leash. You know, you're not gonna be running your dog in an area that's meant for something else and the dog will be controlled. But I think dogs sometimes are still going to go to the bathroom on the surface and that's part of the problem we're having. We also don't have children rolling around on the ground usually. But there's, well, um, but a ball, if you're hitting a ball and then picking it up in your hand, um, that, that's the difficulty. I'm just slack jawed because I've never seen a dog in a tennis court <laughs> yeah, or basketball court. Um, I well, I've seen, I've seen a dog like inside the basketball court, but kind of like on a leash, you know, with the family. Other discussion? Just by creating this category, it kind of goes away from all the other categories. It's true. I, I, I don't think there's a, I don't think it's a necessary. I, yeah, I don't think it's necessary. I, I'm gonna hope that Matt talks to some enforcement around it, because. Uh, I, I, I think it may fall under the management of the park. Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to address that and to talk with staff. And yeah. it's a really small space. And we had, there was one lady who was training dogs there last winter and uh, they were therapy dogs or uh, whatever you call them. And uh, she, was, she seemed to be fine, uh, but we're putting a pretty good investment now into the same surface that she was on. So I can't see that going forward. Uh, but generally it hasn't been something that's been a burning issue that staff's had to had to address, but if it does, we can we can address it on the fly under the management of the park provisions, I believe. Much as I would decide where we, you know, what we do for parking enforcement and other other areas that we that we would have as elements of the park. Okay. Do you want to withdraw the motion, Chris? Um, I just vote it down. It's easy. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, uh, so back to approving the overall management plan with all the amendments that have been added or not. Any other discussion on that? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? It passes. All right. Next up is item number 132-2019, Greenbelt License, 15 Silva Drive. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, um, last year the Conservation Committee was working with resident Bruce Arbach about opening casual trail access in his property. And it's a popular link between the Winnick Woods property and uh, the land trust Dyer Hutchinson easement. Um, the representatives of the Conservation Committee in town walked the trail with the Sarbrock family in December. In August, the Conservation Committee unanimously voted to recommend to the town council to approve the license. Uh, this is the second license agreement expanding the town greenbelt, uh, the first being over in the Canterbury condo area. Is there a motion? Um, I move that we accept the license agreement. Um, as presented in the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Straw, is there any discussion? I just want to note, um, I believe the materials mentioned that this is the second trail license that we've done. Um, I think this is a wonderfully flexible tool. Um, I'm glad to see that we're continuing to use it. Um, and I uh, want to thank Mr. Sarbeck for working with the Conservation Committee to make this happen. Thank you. Other comments or discussion? If I may, Mr. Chairman, yep. I want to thank um, Maureen O'Mara as well for the work that she did with the Conservation Committee because this was an access point that was quite frankly un under threat and uh, this was a very successful negotiation working with the property owners to show that this is something that's a great positive and the Sarbex were, were, were great to work with on this as well. But uh, it was a lot of good effort put forward to maintain this access and this license agreement is really a useful tool to ensure that and allow, allow folks to have that. So thank you for that. that thank work. you. 
Thank you, Maureen. Thank you to the Conservation Committee. Um, I share in, um, those sentiments and, and particularly Councilor Gabrielson's thoughts that um, the, while well, seldom used, the license agreement I, I hope is something that is considered by residents, um, property owners in town as um, a very good um, uh, and somewhat flexible in terms of its, its long-term um, uh, adaptability. Um, uh, for creating this kind of access, but also maintaining um, a little bit more control uh, of ownership and usage and things like that than sometimes an easement allows for. So if you think about the progression, it's sort of license, easement, and then actual outright sale of the property to the town. Um, this is sort of a good first step, and I think if there's other property owners in town that um, are sort of unsure about whether or not um, to be granting public access, that this is a, a good way to facilitate that um, while still keeping options a little bit more flexible than in some other ways. So. Uh, if there's no other further discussion, all those in favor? Great, that passes. Next is uh, item number 133-2019, uh, interfund transfers and bond council order for the lease purchase of equipment. Uh, is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on this? Seeing none. Matt, you wanna summarize this for us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, what you, what you have here are uh, a, a few different items that uh, the council needs to, I, I believe you may be able to, uh, move on them and block if you would like to. Uh, it's some, some of it is housekeeping in order to make sure the funds get authorized to be transferred as part of the finalization of the current municipal budget. So you'll see that we have under, uh, under A uh, funds that would be transferred from different uh, current general ledger funds to, uh, to other projects or the funds that we have to help us uh, do purchases that do take place in this year's current budget. The second one on B is uh, is great news. This is uh, authorizing us to do the lease purchase agreement uh, through TD Bank. And as you recall, back during the budget process, we were looking at a 4% rate or anticipating based on where market conditions were at the time. We're coming out at 2.09. Uh, so that's great work. Uh, John Q and I uh, have worked on this with uh, Jim Safian uh, as well as with TD Bank, and uh, they've, they have, we've had a good relationship with them and it continues to this point. So that's bringing this forward for a five-year uh, uh, lease purchase agreement. And then from that would flow the purchase of, uh, of, our, uh, of the new front-end loader and rotary mower that was part of our capital improvement, which is paid for by the uh, by the use of the lease purchase agreement. You'll notice that uh, both items came in under budget from what we had anticipated, so that's a significant savings for the town. Uh, so it's a, it's a double win. Uh, we also have uh, identifies the debt service payments that will need to take place, uh, as well as a transfer of the general fund and assigned fund balance for our CIP projects. And then ultimately the last one is to accept an appropriate, this is a, for a uh, unraised drinking grant of $1,000 from Jericho Safety uh, that was bestowed upon the, the PD uh, and it's the, for the council to accept us so we could end up allocating those funds. Great. Thank you for the summary, Matt. Uh, somebody like to make a motion to approve the transfers and appropriations? I move that we approve the interfund transfers and appropriations as presented in the agenda. Second. Second. Second by Council Straw. Any discussion? Uh, Council Jordan. I don't know if this is uh, there's a typo that you might want to have from a date perspective on F. Um, oh yeah. Oh yes. Uh, <laughs> it's twenty twenty. <laughs> It's a perpetual yeah. gift. Yeah. <laughs> Which year is it? 2020. Yeah, That's maybe. a lot. It'll be for this uh, current fiscal year, Councilor Jordan. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification on that. June 30th, 2020. Any other discussion? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Matt and uh, John Q and team. Appreciate it. Uh, all those in favor? Great. Next up is item number 134-2019, State of Maine Bicentennial Celebration. Is there anybody wishing to speak on this? Seeing none. Um, so I think we discussed it previously. Um, we've had some inquiries about uh, whether or not the town uh, specifically would look to do anything to celebrate and recognize the state bicentennial. Uh, the proposal here is to uh, have the manager uh, draft a committee charge, which we can look at in October, if we wanted to appoint an ad hoc committee, uh, similar to what we did for the 250th for CAPE. So uh, is there a motion? 
Councillor Jordan? Um, I would move that uh, we create an ad hoc committee in order to develop um, ideas on the bicentennial for the state of Maine. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? Um, my question is, uh, would the appointments on this, and maybe it'll be part of the charge that you draft, uh, go through a regular appointments process or at the will of the council and manager? At, at the will of the council is what, what we desired. That way we could kind of jump uh, ahead a little bit, although it, the bicentennial is throughout the entirety of 2020. Uh, like to try to get folks on board to do that, and I have some thoughts as far as how the structure would be that I'll okay. bring back next month. Great. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Last is uh, item 135-2019, Energy Committee update. I assume nobody from the public wishing to speak on this. Uh, so the uh, Energy Committee is looking to meet with the council to update us on, our work, on their work. So I'm looking for a motion to set to a workshop in October on the 2nd, uh, that as an agenda item. Is there a motion? So moved. Council Straw, is there a second? Council Randall, any discussion? Council so uh, it gives me great angst as we're approaching the end of the year because the tax credits are gonna start expiring, although I read something in the newspaper that Maine was gonna offer some new ones or something. Uh, is there any chance, I, I'm assuming we're just out of luck at this uh, point on the timeline, but is there any chance they're gonna come to us with a like proposal we're ready to go with to vote? I don't, you know? I don't believe they no. are at this point, but I, but there are, uh, I am buoyed by the thought that there is uh, more discussion about additional credits that will be forthcoming to. Um, may not be on the federal side, but on the state side, I know that's a, that's a very lively discussion. So we may, uh, it's something that's gonna be, be around, I think. Uh, some might come after 2020 on the federal level, but uh, I can't speculate as <laughs> to that at this point. <laughs> but I do know that they've been, they've been very busy looking at different areas uh, as far as potential projects, and I think they want to weigh in the council as to where they're at now and see if they're, they want to make sure they're not going in the wrong, wrong direction or where the council doesn't feel that they should be heading. Other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Any last comments from anybody on anything not on tonight's <laughs> agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Moved by Councillor Jordan, second by Councillor Randall. All in favor? Great.